Hello everyone, today we talk about the early knights and the rise of the military class during the High Middle Ages. So this is a very um, approximated video that I'm making essentially to, to observe uh, how the, the military class was developing roughly in the 11th century. And if you're a regular user, you know that I, I, on Schwerpunkt at this point I started a series that I haven't still formalized into a playlist, but that is dedicated, you know, in, in broad terms, to the development um, of knighthood uh, in, um, in, b in a bit of a, even a trans-temporal mm, dimension. I mean, the idea of, uh, well, of, of course not completely, but, you know, um, in my opinion, basically knighthood developed from uh, the, from, from a series of, of influences, chiefly for Europe, the, um, essentially the, the Indo-Aryan conception of uh, of warriorhood of manhood and how this basically that this was reinforced over the millennia into the uh, among the european populations even when they they had become essentially sedentary um and it's a very complicated story and definitely i think that the the concept of night is n is not at all something narrowly meant rising in in western europe as that specific you know technological thing of you know armored knight plus war horse and so on but it actually has uh, much more ancient roots and roots that really are um, permeated with a lot of religious sacred magical how you whatever you want to call it meanings that <coughs> in this sense were not created properly into the middle ages but were a bit of, of, at the base of the same uh, Western uh, culture and civilization. Um, it, this is particularly interesting because obviously the concept of knighthood um, does not belong only to uh, to the West, of course. Um, usually a knighthood is reinforced in those um, societies that assume a sort of feudal asset. So if you look at, I don't know, Persia and Japan, but definitely there is also a um, a, a different uh, culture in, in other ways, and that um, the Eastern knighthood, even in terms of uh, think about the symbols, think about weapons, think how you know what what's the sword, for instance, for the West, and what's the bow for for the East. Um, <coughs> so we're not going to discuss those differences now. I, I will definitely make tons of, uh, of videos about that as well. Uh, I made this premise essentially because you might say, but, but why are you talking just about the 11th century now? Well, because essentially this is uh, in the process of, of development of, of Western feudal society, a very important century, uh, uh, probably not not even the most important for defining the um <coughs> the identity and the uh, and the political social order of um, and political social power, let's say, of the m knightly uh, slash military class at this time, um, and uh, a series of other, you know, mm, mostly consequences at this point of the rise of knighthood uh, in the West. Arguably, <coughs> you know, even if you want to stick to the feudal perspective in terms of you know, saying, you know, that we we're talking about knights in medieval Europe, we we're essentially thinking about that political and military elite stemming from, from the feudal society. However, the, uh, th in my opinion, the most important century is the tent, mm? because we have seen in other videos how essentially f since the, the 8th century, um, the Carolingians were developing this, uh, re say, uh, re uh, um, intensifying and strengthening the, the essentially the clienterly uh, vassalatic beneficiary relations that also in here burn uh, it's very complicated topic how it was born and developed it stem part from the germanic world it stem in part from the roman world um <coughs> it was pretty transversal in many ways so th this is perhaps the most important thing to to remember that we're still talking about clienterly societies. So when we talk about the feudal world, it's as if sometimes you said, okay, well, uh, the feudal world was born from a certain point onwards, but the feudal world in itself is nothing but a clienterly society, and all societies at this point were clienterly in many ways. Uh, the real difference at this point is that, uh, at least in European history, and it would be interesting to compare also with other ones, because it would possibly be in world history uh, as well, in part, you know, this concentration of a, 
of, of an enormous quantity of resources in the hands of a very few um, <coughs> was developing something very very different that with the, with the rise of the uh, Western night as this um, essentially not just as, as a um, dominating force on the battlefield from a military point of view therefore but also as a political leader, political guided, and we've seen this, for instance, in those videos when we were talking about the strengthening of, or the, uh, the birth. I don't remember now the title because, by the way, I'm, I'm out of um, internet connection, so I can't even uh, address you to other videos I make. But you know, if you look at medieval societies, I, I made some video that um, <coughs> looks at the development of the so-called feudal monarchies and that is very interesting because also in here we, re we realize how much um, public authority that had existed especially in the wake of the Roman tradition and of the Germanic um, idea of, of freedom and so on in the early medieval times at this point was basically almost um, non-existent meaning that the public authority now was uh, in itself a private authority it was no really uh, really a strong centralization and the same development of the feudal monarch uh, of the monarchies during the the uh, the, the high middle ages uh, to the 13th even was being built on the base not of a public conception but essentially following the same rules and forms of uh, the feudal uh, of the feudal world how it had been forming now so what is fascinating of this phase is practically that after Carolingian times, so from you know the decline of the um, uh, the, the the empire, and especially during the 10th century, uh, per, uh, the the fragment the political f uh, fragmentation of medieval Europe had paradoxically brought to an homogenization of the um, let's say political and social uh, spectrum in many ways, for which all of these <coughs> counts or uh, other vassals of the Carolingian Empire had now uh, all their own uh, castles, all their own uh, retinues, they controlled vast areas of, uh, I mean relatively of course, vast areas, this could vary wildly of course um, in, in, in this sense, in fact it, it, it kept up a sort of hierarchy in spite of the decline of public authority uh, of, uh, of a territorial power and this was originating, in fact, a common series of practices and of, um, you know, and, and, and a sort of class identity among the so-called milites. Mm -hmm. Today we will not actually look at exactly at this moment. Uh, we will, in fact, at, because by the 11th century uh, this process had already been formed in, uh, or at least it had uh, reached a very advanced stage of uh, of definition of formalization um, more or less because this eventually the full feudal world is something you look in in, in mostly at in, in the 13th century the 13th century was really the apex both of the feudal world and consequently of I don't know the preeminence of, uh, of, of feudal knights and about heavy cavalry on the battlefield and, and so on but um, definitely the, the most important part for defining this uh, new class of, of, of warriors uh, had happened in the 10th century and this is very interesting because it's as if in spite of all this fragmentation uh, there was a sort of a recognition of of of, of um, nobility essentially I mean these aristocrats were looking at each other and in spite of fighting ferociously the one against the other we're still essentially saying okay yeah we, we make all this mess we, we fight against each other but we are still uh, something similar we're still a class that uh, has a uh, similar lifestyle has similar interests has similar pride mm -hmm. Um, and definitely we um, we represent a, a body of and this has been a kind of romanticized sometimes and, and by saying that uh, knights tended not to especially noblemen let's say because also in here the difference can be striking especially at the beginning the knights could be really you know just anyone who, to, who, who for some reason had a, a sword in his hand uh, and an armor preferably actually and you could be also you could come literally from everywhere and, and being one then eventually with the, the structuration of feudalism this became uh, really much more hierarchical the, 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 there were certain segmentations that it was can 
in start observe or also from uh, from this time roughly for which there were you know there was something like uh, besides the royalty and say the high nobility and then the lesser nobility and then all these other minor uh, sort of gentry that in part also uh, in, in different uh, areas of Europe it had also different statuses and origins and so on and that is also a very interesting chapter once we have to, to talk about this you know the difference in knighthood in spite of the uh, homogeneity also the character the different uh, mm, peculiarities I don't know how to say the specificities uh, characteristics of the various European uh, knights uh, the point I was making is that by the 11th, uh, however, that uh, at the origin, this was still, and already uh, by the 11th century, this mobility was still pretty, pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, the sa after all, the same, um, the same Euro European world was still relatively primitive and poor, and therefore, uh, this, by the way, in part increased the the kind of egalitarianism that existed even within the knights. Mm -hmm. Wars, uh, war was endemic, and sometimes it's even difficult to, to define it as war because this knights now we will see had a pretty violent lifestyle. Uh, certain people try to deny this because they want to stress what essentially on the wake uh, of of the same 11th century. Um, uh, political propaganda was now being formulated, and we will see it here in the theory of the three orders where everything was so much in harmony in this uh, perfectly uh, Christian, uh, harmonious Christian world, say that, that everything was fine. No, it was actually pretty violent time, and it wasn't violent because it was Christian or it was anything, but simply because humans are violent, and in, in that political social conditions with that, uh, you know, dynamics of wealth distribution. Uh, it brings you know reality to be like that. Uh, in I don't know, 13th century wars were much more devastating usually than 11th century wars, um, in uh, individually speaking. But by the 11th century, you know, knights were conceived like kind of a pretty homogeneous class in 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 relative terms. While in the 13th century, you have already a very um, highly stratified uh, society. Um, so. Also, obviously, in in proportion during the eleventh century, it was obviously who was enormously wealthier and who was you know, just a single knight. The, the most evident um, indicator at this point can be naturally the, the same. I think that pr exactly the obviously wealth in general. I mean, what how much you practically possess in terms of land, because this in the eleventh century, that yeah, there, there was some mo monetary circulation, but it was mostly a largely an, an, an agrarian world still um, and um, and that is an indicator but also another good one is the same um, uh, you know position you have within the, cl the the feudal clientels I mean which which say how how many uh, knights do you have in your in your retinue for instance is that a pretty good indicator I, even having you know something like 40 knights that you're um, you know, in your retinue by the eleventh century, what it meant it meant you were a pretty powerful man, uh, objectively. That's that's kind of a interestingly enough, there were also certain women, heiresses of great fortunes of feudal um properties. Think about the Canossa family in central and northern Italy. This was you know, and there was mm, this heiress Matilda who was uh, extremely powerful. She was in charge of all this enormous quantity of of, uh, of land, and uh, she had armies on her own. So uh, this is very interesting because, uh, for us, it's difficult to understand. We we often have this perception that whoever is at the top is some sort of evil person that obliges others to to work for him or her. But this is not really the truth. You know, these clientels were actually, and this is very important and also inherent in the concept of serfdom sometimes, even what sometimes is called slavery in the Middle Ages, that is not quite, you know, really what the you know ancient slavery was really about. It's, it's a sort of mutual uh, duty that is beautifully expressed, in fact, by the vassalic, vassalic beneficiary relations, where you had a senior and, uh, and a uh, bassus that essentially um, had a uh, had recipro uh, uh, reciprocal duties to one towards the other. The senior naturally was more powerful. The vassal, the vassus was kind of a uh, follower. So this was not a really a paritary relation, of course. But at the same time, uh, and this is often misunderstood, the the same concept of feudal 
uh, system entails a constant redistribution of resources for you know, if anything because if you don't redistribute your resources you have basically no way to fuel your clientele so uh, even this idea of you know stupid interpretate marxist interpretations of history like you know this was a so uh, an oppressive time and no it was not and arguably oppression actually increased in, in much in modern times because that was the moment when you know, society got more stratified, more uh, verticized. I don't know how to say that in English. Now I have even my uh, <laughs> have the book uh, in my the dictionary in my hand because uh, I don't have uh, the internet con connection anymore. But there is a term that is the I usually use stratified, which kind of gives an I very physical idea. But um, but there is also more a visual idea that is the let me check. Everything is much more difficult <laughs> with, you know, looking into pages. Um, basically, here to said to, to to increase it the verticality of a system. You know, the idea that trees is sort of vertex orientating a system in a vertical way, and this is also what what was happening definitely. And this was a moment of relative, um, you know, acceleration towards that thing but uh, by the 11th century uh, knights were still pretty much um, you know they felt themselves to be pretty much equal in, in certain on a certain ground and this is something you can see for instance even at a political level in the history of, of the various kingdoms uh, that were forming or you know actually were or existing for by you know since either as post Carolingian kingdoms or pre-existing things like in uh, in, in, in Anglo-Saxon later Norman England uh, or you know uh, in other contexts that, that basically the king was consider, uh, considered just like a primus inter pares and this was this is very important which what does it mean it, be it means first among equals basically in Latin um, and it, um, it it stressed basically the idea that uh, the ancient, you know, Germanic ideal freeman mixed a bit also with the concept of imperium in in a Roman and Christian fashion at the same time. That is naturally was stressed in different ways from both sides. Really, uh, that basically, um, you know, the king was not by right someone who you know could do whatever he wanted and was inherently superior to others basically was just a military leader that was chosen, was appointed basically by the assembly of freemen mm, read at this point the high nobility that obviously didn't give a damn about freemen at this point anymore because they were basically progressively uh, you know, curbing them in their political autonomy and so on um, that uh, you know, was there just in virtue because for the sake of command? You know, it's pretty pretty obvious from biology, from anything that you know, every uh, in the animal kingdom, d there are certain structures that are necessary in order to 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 to, ma to make society work, and therefore also humans tend um, to organize themselves vertically. And the reason, how, however, I'd, what was what these noblemen were questioning is was essentially the uh, right of the king to uh, exact certain amount of uh, services from them. That was obviously, they didn't want to do. And then at this point, um, um, well, it would be very interesting to study how this evolved in, in over time because eventually we know that monarchies uh, strengthened over time. So part of the reason was definitely the constant warfare that was going on uh, partly dictated by technological reasons I mean it seems that you know for instance the introduction of trebuchet just like it would happen for firearms a couple of couple of um, centuries later would basically increase the process of centralization because now um, you know it, it was not enough just to have a stinky moat and bailey castle to to engulf uh, a wall the army of a world kingdom for, for for months basically in a, in an inconclusive siege now you could basically go past that so uh, there was more money needed for building machineries having them functioning I made several videos about this and especially building castles, being is building stronger castles, and therefore, you know, a bit bringing a war uh, towards a much more dynamic directions where um, armies, in this sense, could stop now only to certain bigger castles and uh, 
you know, a strategical from a strategical point of view, there was a wider range of, of operations, and this entailed a, a response in terms of collective organization of the army all over the kingdom to respond that threat. So all. Um, uh, you can argue that feudal monarchies were in part forged in war, also because the political and social elite this time was doing nothing, and actually arguably any, everyone at this point, were doing nothing but war. Mm. There are people who don't like war, and I, I really don't understand why. Uh, <laughs> well, of course, nobody likes war when we are in it, but you know the interest in, towards military history, I think, t I mean, in war, for, it's something uh, I'm dedicating my life to it. So, um, and, and you know, there are so many studies about you know the, the institutional level, you know, the, the lifestyle, economics, and so on. But if if you really study the sources of all times at this point, you realize that like uh, something like 95 percent of everything that is written is about war, and and everything revolves around war. This was the normal mm, dialect, political dialectic that that. That existed at the time. It, it was not because of you know of evil, of some reasons that these guys were bloodthirsty monsters. Like obviously knights were pretty violent and also psychologically fucked up. If you really want uh, the, the the historical truth about it, uh, but uh, the uh, the the idea that there was mm, th there weren't many other ways out of that. And and uh, objectively now it's complicated to explain. We have to pass finally to knights, but. This is important to conceive as a background, that war was not an option at that time. War was not an option. War was not an option. And uh, and uh, although this naturally created many problems to which, and we will say it now, the, um, uh, the, the, the society was trying to, you know, to, to put it, to, to find a solution for, objectively, not because they were anti-war, because they were pacifists. Not even the church was pacifist at this time, but it was recognized that at least there were now certain activities, certain interests that entailed, um, you know, that required a sort of pacification, at least in certain contexts, to, to make uh, society flourish, and therefore war could be, uh, had to be performed, but it had to be channeled to, towards other directions. This brought, in part, was one of the factors that triggered the Crusades, for instance, uh, but it's not only that. In, in generally speaking, there was at this time also a great, um, uh, you know, a, a revival of the political uh, theory uh, speculation, um, for which you know it was a great um, uh, a great debate about you know what's what's just war, for instance. Where where is that a Christian that inherently sins, where he, he or she kills anyone? Uh, and, and yet, you know, how do we justify war that is so, you know, that is a, an elementary and macroscopical structural datum of this society that uh, was defined essentially by war? How do we justify it? How do we make it, you know, great? That this obviously wasn't started into the 11th century, but in the 11th century, for some reasons that we will see now, uh, it was uh, progressively emphasized and. Uh, uh, and new solutions were, were to be found. Excuse me, I drink a little before we go on. So, <coughs> as we were saying before, we can say that around the, the year 1000 AD, basically the development and the spread of banal lordships uh, in centered, uh, gravitating on, on castles essentially and the land that the, those castles dominated, had made it necessary um a uh, a greater uh, an ever growing number of s specialists of war mm -hmm. so we're talking about many people that at this point were uh, in fact part of the seniorial retinues and that were uh, we're not just uh, talking only about uh, knights proper uh, there were so many other you know the society was segmented in the sense that that old society was kind of uh, Universally oriented toward that uh, that thing, um, knights uh, uh, had their own uh, squires already. That there was someone who had to provide, you know, just for keeping the, uh, you know, um, maintaining, supporting the, the lordships and so on. So you have also bands of peasants that participated to seigneurial raids. Um, at this point, the peasantry was also actually pretty active and powerful, and it was an active. 
uh, you know, a, a protagonist of the political and social events in Tunis, still largely a rural world, of, uh, into wars and clashes and so on, where peasants at this time were very, 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 uh, even aggressive in many ways. So there was a kind of common interest in this world where war was kind of endemic. The uh, Europe, by the way, had just come out from this ninth, um, tenth century. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, the period of the so called uh, second invasions where objectively Europe had been ravaged uh, for, you know, intensively by Vikings, uh, uh, Saracens, and, and, and Hungers. Uh, but also, in there, um, really, the major political and military activity was represented by the seigneurial movement. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been talking on Schwerpunkt how encastellation was by by large, actually, not triggered by the so-called second invasions, but by the political fragmentation uh, of, of post-Carolingian Europe. It was essentially a uh, something that that started from within Europe, uh, not really because someone, you know, came from the outside. It, it was this. This was a pretty violent world to just study. You know what? Uh, you know the disgregation of Carolingian, the Carolingian Empire looked like. How many is nobility basically started butchering each other at a certain point in itself. So war was pretty much out there and it, it had arguably always been in, in great part. I mean, this is important especially for the mindset. Uh, you know, vast areas of Europe had been, uh, before the Carolingian conquest, still, you know, characterized by a tribal, you know, warfare lifestyle and uh, they had to have strong military edits and so on. So uh, war was, was normal in many ways. At this point, however, there was the rise of the specialists of war, the, the professionals of war, that uh, emerged in part also from what the Carolingians had uh, fueled as a basalotic beneficiary system, that were the so-called milites. Milites is probably the best term, instead of using knight, that is very, you know, uh, you know, it's it's good. Uh, objectively, we all understand what it means, but really the... Uh, the proper term in absolute uh, term, also semantically speaking, etymologically speaking, is the miles mm, in Latin. Miles, plural, milites, um, that you find basically uh, in the sources pretty universally. You know, the, la uh, the, 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 the Europe at this point was writing in Latin, of course, and the miles was definitely the prototype of the actually of the soldier. Mm. Also in here, um, the, the, the evolution of the term milis is very complicated. Actually, it, um, there is all an evolution also semantically speaking, conceptually speaking. Uh, think also about the, the Christian militia, for instance, or the, um, uh, the, the concept of what this whatever it meant. Uh, the, the same concept of military society is something that evolves I mean that uh, it bec because it, it started permeating the world society I, in the ancient world in the Roman world, for instance, uh, the Milas was a just a part of the society it was essentially a, the guy who went to war into into the legions was paid by the state to go fight against the barbarians something like that. Uh, at this point, the Milas is something much uh, more uh, much deeply rooted into society at every level because society is uh, basically influenced by these um, and. and arguably gravitates around these guys that are literally the elite. They, they are the top of society. They have the the power and the strength to go to rule, basically. Um, uh, Miles is, um, is, is a term that basically um, was originated uh, to define it to the, the, an the archaic Roman army, those who received, I, th I think, it, uh, its wheat, the, the etymology, it, uh, the real etymology basically comes from this. I mean, those were the, the guys who were paid through wheat usually, and that were therefore the ones who uh, uh, were the, it's as if the, the wheaters basically that's what Minas uh, comes from. Um, so, this was the real um, uh, meaning. Over the centuries, this has acquired an increasingly and more markedly uh, military professional uh, exception. Definitely, this is what you know. If in, in, in the Latin sources, Milas really means it's the guy who fights. Well, obviously, also in the same feudal world, the 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 conception of Milas is uh, is really varying. 
uh, sometimes, especially in the later times, we, we don't really understand because Minas could be... Uh, now we think of the knight as the guy was uh, armored from, uh, from, uh, from head to toe, essentially, but sometimes the Minas at one point uh, could be even just a simple cavalryman in many ways. It was an approximation. Uh, so also in here, the, the Middle Ages are, are, are huge. So also in here, the w words change, meaning uh, varies. But broadly speaking, the, the, the Minas is, the, is equatable to the knight or the cavalryman, it depends. Um, but mostly the knight in the, the context we're, we are discussing now. Um, that, however, as we said before, um, didn't exclude the concept of, uh, you know, really of, uh, of, of segmentation in, in some way, because uh, at this point uh, the, uh, the, the knights could have um, the most diverse origins, and very frequently, actually, at this point, the Minas could also have very humble, very humble origins. Uh, these uh, troops, in fact, evolved usually from the retinues of lords that originally weren't using other knights. I mean, these had originated from servants, from people that were in origin, in fact, peasants or helpers of any other type of extraction. And in fact, uh, the um, in 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 the different uh, vulgar uh, languages that you you can st um, still excuse me, the, the uh, different vernacular languages, this term um, really originated from, uh, f even from this background. Excuse me, I drink a little, a little bit once again. In fact, <coughs> first of all, the same, um, the same Latin miles basically um, looked at a kind of a low social context. Th this is very important because you know that the miles at that point, in, in, into the, an in the ancient world, was defining the uh, whoever was kind of paid. I mean, it was like the Roman citizen fighting. This didn't entail any form of nobility, also because at that time the Romans were, in theory, quite um, you know egalitarian-minded, for which you know everybody participated to the army as long as you were a free man. That naturally was a privilege. And um, in this sense, there is a parallelism between uh, the, I don't know, the, the idea of, uh, for instance, of Germanic freemen that had reinforced in part, not really the concept of Minas, but, you know, the idea that there is a freeman who, who has the right of bearing arms. Well, the Romans essentially came from the same Indo-European stock, so basically that was the same idea. The only difference now is at that point they were framing that not into a tribe, but into a city, that it was a set of tribes, really at that point. But you know that in, in Latin the term for uh, for knight would be equus. You know, the equites were essentially the Roman knightly class, those who fought on horseback and were really the knights of the ancient of ancient Rome at least. Uh, this is important to stress because um, I made a video on for instance of archaic Roman cavalry that deals with that. That is even um, in, into which I stress actually the strong Indo-European root of the concept of knighthood, even to the Roman society that was much more cavalry oriented at the beginning than we imagine. Uh, people picture just you know the early uh, you know the, the Roman army just thinking oh the Romans had a few and uh, and bad cavalry and uh, yeah they, they, they didn't uh, they weren't knightly oriented, they were just like a, I don't know, a 19th century national state, a uh, uh, modern state that looks more like us than one of the barbarians. No, actu actually not. The Romans actually originated from an extremely strong and deeply rooted um, Indo-European warlike model. And even at, at the peak of their kind of secularization and the modernization of their armored forces, actually they retained pretty heavy, um, uh, you know, pretty heavy uh, legacy of that. And and the uh, and, and actually the Romans put a, f a, a this is uh, something I can't stress enough a, a freaking huge importance of cavalry and people totally ignored that because they just think you know cavalry you know it's uh, the Romans had a few cavalry so for them it, it was not important for some reason no first of all it was not an option you can't have cavalry in certain types of you know now it's complicated but uh, also in there in, into the Roman world it was a strong a much stronger characterization of mounted fighter that was expressed by the term equus that was not used into into uh, Latin. This, this is 
this uh, to medieval Latin importantly enough of course in the sources you can find many times uh, aquas uh, aquitas you you can it's pretty it's pretty normal um, especially when you want to stress um, uh, certain well now it's complicated because every source really uses terms as as it pleases to it but uh, uh, the idea is sometimes that the meless obviously the more feudal society developed and the more it came to define essentially a a knight in fact uh, interestingly enough uh, the the universal distinction let's say at that point of, of cavalry and infantry in the latin sources is uh, milites and petites mm. the petites are the footmen essentially and so it's interestingly enough it's as if you said uh, the soldiers and the, and the footmen doesn't mean much. I mean, obviously, I'm stressing now the soldiers, the soldiers, those who are paid. But this is this is the idea that that the term miles had and the militia proper had acquired this stronger meaning, um, for which um, these weren't just soldiers like others. They were practically mounted, uh, armored here. They were heavy cavalry substantially and. And not only, also other type of cavalry, but also the fact of just being a fighting horseback was considered to be a sort of privilege. And in this sense, it, the, the number of militants even comprehended uh, in the sources very often without distinction the same squires and other lighter uh, horsemen that came uh, together with them. So this is also pretty interesting and it's interesting to observe. You, you can't really generalize, but this is the trend. It's fascinating to look at all the various sources and see how they were uh, looking at the thing and expressing it. But um, so Minas originated not from Equus, so it, it it originated really from this low base uh, that arguably stresses just like the familia, for instance, or the masnata, the um, um, the idea of a, a humble soldier, the familia. Uh, uh, is uh, the the family, for instance, are normally uh, the the peasants at this point, uh, or however troops that you know fought for a lord a, in this kind of familiar relation. You know, the familia in Latin was something much more extended. Was in part the same clientele in itself. Uh, the same goes for, in fact, the masnata. Probably you have heard it's a pretty uh, wide term that derived from uh, machinata. So essentially the and those uh, the, it indicated those troops that were paid with uh, with floor for making bread. So in in this extremely poor world, of the uh, you know post Carolingian times, where there were was a very few money to pay soldiers with, and uh, you know the full monetization, financization. I don't know how to say that of the market of war happened mostly in the 13th century. And before these ga guys were um, paid in nature. So with the also the agricultural products of the Lord. In fact, they lived with the Lord in in, the, in his household. They 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 could uh, you know the Lord basically provided them with the equipment, including the military one and the supplies and so on. So that also was why why these guys were gravitating as a retinue for these lords because the lords owned the uh, the wealth and these guys were all around and uh, you have so many parallelisms like if you look at the uh, germanic tribal world it was essentially the same as there were back in the day uh, time of the roman empire and so on these germanic bands of mercenaries where there was the guy at the top the leader who basically uh, redistributed the uh, the loot and so on and the weaponry and but that was the the concept that you followed essentially a military leader that could provide you with uh, the means of uh, substantiation and for for making a life out of the profession of war interestingly enough so uh, much of the rise of knighthood is partly related to this um, we we distinguish it from mercenarism but objectively in perspective it's it, it's also relatively difficult to, to 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 divide. I mean, these guys were making a living out of it. They weren't really, yeah. There were this um, oath of allegiance and uh, oath of allegiance and s stuff like that. But uh, there were those evident also economical dynamics for which they participated to a lower retinue, and um, and different bands could be hired over at the time. So really, actually, mercenarism was never out of it. 
mercenarism uh, was something that developed more evidently in other in later times but it was at the base of uh, the uh, of warfare in these centuries uh, as well and if you look at the uh, vernacular uh, you find the same kind of uh, low social context for instance uh, the same english knight definitely derives from the germanic uh, knith uh, that uh, was initially uh, used to design the uh, the serfs basically and the same goes for uh, knecht uh, in, in german that's the same thing for instance the landsknecht it literally means uh, the serfs of the uh, of the country um, and and this is important because it stresses the fact that these were um, actually serfs it, and this is not something you have to give for granted because that was a society that strongly emphasized the differences between uh, the uh, the freemen and the serfs and at this time arguably society was transforming itself more in you know between the noblemen and the serfs but this was also the original germanic edus i mean the idea that the freeman in itself had kind of won uh, his own freedom it was not something that derived just from uh, lineage yeah it, it, it because it, it definitely uh, was so you know the son of a freeman was a freeman himself him himself but uh, uh, it, it was as if you know th there was something that had been um, won uh, also through blood in some way. You know, it's you know how is that this idea of noble blood stemmed from? You could say I'm noble just because I don't know of my accomplishment. No, there was this kind of a proto genetical uh, belief of this. The idea that the the blood of the nobles was kind of superior to the one of the, the peasants. It's something very borderline to, to racism in many ways. I'm not kidding. Uh, if it, it, it's a huge genetic perspective and that derived back straight to the Germanic world where the idea was that you know the superior guy was defeated the other had the right to, to, to rule over that person. So that person was kind of a inferior also in kind of physical terms because this was a world by the way that um, enormously emphasized the, the idea of, of of values of especially individual values of of, um, of strength of prowess uh, even of beauty you know even if in the full you know in the 13th century one of the values of the christian knight was being beautiful was having long hair and uh, being muscular and tall that, that was really the ideal um, and and you understand in, th in this sense how this individualistic Addis of you know yeah, I'm bigger I'm stronger I'm, I'm tougher is was was still alive and uh, it stressed the idea that freemen in the sense of a sort of nobility that distinguishes them from the other uh, from the others in fact during the feudal world really uh, peasants were you know really depreciated they, they were thought to be barely human beings I'm not kidding and they were they were actually if you look at uh, you know later sources not just from the feudal world but at that point also by the communal world that are kind of motivated this higher lifestyle etc if you look at how they describe peasants you know it's something awful they th basically said they were half animals they were barely human beings they were disgusting that they had to be you know they were stupid and it, that's really how they were conceived and uh, how they were seen um, so there was a social segmentation at the same time was corresponded to a sort of moral segmentation that entailed the concept of superiority and inferiority and definitely if you look at even at the military history of of uh, of the high and low middle ages you understand it even for instance the rise of the commoners uh, on the European battlefields especially between the, the 13th and the 14th century was something that really went beyond because those communities had during the feudal age being basically framed into a, a, a subdued in the condition of, of moral inferiority I mean these people had really felt themselves to be inferior and nobody dared to to rebel to say okay but let's take arms against the knight so that's why you know at the battle of Courtrai or Courtrica as you, you want to say it in 1302 you had all this uh, a, an army that was exclusively composed of conners that defeated uh, the, the flower of um, Western cavalry that was the uh, of Christian cavalry was the, the French one and and that uh, you know with all these peasants basically bringing uh, peasants and commoners bringing their the golden spores uh, taken stripped from the the French knights to, to their church 
uh, in Bruges uh, or Brugge uh, better. Um, and you know that was like as if you know sometimes we we overlook this psychological aspect. It's as if the world had w gone in reverse. Commerce defeating knights. What what the hell? I mean this is and and that was important because all these victories also that had occurred. Uh, you know this episode, let's say that um, uh, rare episodes during the, the 12th and the 13th century, where there were some commoners that even had dared to take arms against a mounted the mounted elite, were conceived like a um, something so extraordinary that it also partly woke up the commoners and made them gain confidence and, and morale and saying, okay, but well maybe we can do it. Um, this is that's a very very important thing to bear in mind, and it's important thing to bear in mind because in fact that's where the the knight comes from in part. I mean the idea of the same knight as a serf, not as a true uh, freeman, is it, it's something you find even in societies like the English or the German one that is not so uh, you know maybe. You, you would expect to have been kind of more egalitarian, being part of this kind of northern Germanic world where also society was less stratified. It would be interesting to, to look at deeper into that because I would like to, to explain you more about it. Um, interestingly enough, uh, in, in, in feudal Europe th there was a country that is still Germany that conceived its military class as a, um, as a serf, servile class. Uh, not all of it uh, we should be more uh, should be proper but um, roughly between the 11th especially the 12th century under uh, there is the development of the figure of the so-called ministeriales in germany so what were the ministeriales in latin ministeria um, um, mi means uh, uh, services in latin you know so the idea was that basically these were initially really serfs that even that didn't even have any military connotation initially speaking that however were being developed um in, into into the f german world as kind of um now soldiers slash serfs uh, and they were basically they guided often the armed men o of a lord and could even be uh, given a castle um, and so on. This is very fascinating because technically speaking Germany had a military class of freemen, of course. You know, the Ger you know that in Germany um, feudalism arrived uh, kind of later compared to other areas like, you know, yeah, of course since the Carolingian conquest the Vassalatic beneficiary system had been imported, German society had been quite changed, uh, the aristocracies had taken over um, and freemen had still kind of a probably higher uh, power than other areas of Europe, especially in France, you know, where feudalism had been s already been structured in a more intense way, but it had been a bit different, and it wasn't really the same feudalism that existed, in fact, in Western Frankish Kingdom. It's already from the mid of the second half of the 12th century, especially with the Oenstaufen at power, that uh, the French, you know, the feudalism of French model is is basically imported into Germany and it progressively developed. You can argue that by the mid 13th century, basically Germany was, um, you know, feudalism had spread co completely I in many ways, and 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 it's during this time that the figure of the ministerialis actually evolves because there there was definitely a military class of freemen of noblemen. Of course there were, but surprisingly enough, actually the 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 wide majority of uh, knights in Germany at this point was emerging from this uh, servile class. And they were remaining serfs, essentially. I mean, uh, up to the 14th century, basically, this was a quite well distinguished class of, of, of knights that actually lived, you can argue, in the same exact fashion that, other, that knights in other areas of Europe lived. I mean, their juridical condition was not really a discriminant factor. Uh, in, in the way they would, would practically leave and fight and essentially would would be a, as a raison d'etre, as, as fighters, as warriors. But they, um, they in fact were juridically tied to the lords. That it means that the lord could literally take you as an object and, and sell you somewhere. Not really as an object, because of course the, that's not. There was not really even. It was not really like that juridically. But you you could really be. 
purchased and sold and in fact it's very interesting there are many beautiful books that written by Benjamin Arnold that uh, that uh, illustrate uh, the figure of the Ministeriales in this um, high medieval Germany and I advise you definitely his books because they are um, they're very nice to, to, they open a bit your eyes on what Germany was at the time um, and and um, interestingly enough because I don't know any other context in in uh, in Western in the West where, where you know these were serfs, but at the same time, were these knights were juridically serfs, but at the same time, it's as if this originated a bit from the same, uh, the same background in many ways, because even the same uh, Oscars or you know the the family or the, the other troops etc. had uh, been born from that. It's possible as an explanation. I'm just speculating. Basically, the ministeriales emerged as such because Germany was in part more backwards in this process of um, social certification for which actually the, the idea of serfdom was um, you know uh, was developing uh, um, in, in this sense of military retinue was developing later compared to other countries that already actually stratified the thing it were also wealthier countries and therefore also this the social condition of these lower strata of the uh, of the uh, you know, society was kind of relatively better at least but it, it's probably not so simple to explain and in general it's very fascinating because the ministeriales in Germany uh, emerged uh, basically pretty much in the same fashion they had emerged in, into other uh, contexts you know part of them eventually the now it's very fascinating because if you look at the uh, moment of formation of the uh, the military class in to the 10th century all over Europe generally let's say it's talking in general now um, many of these as we said before many of these knights actually came from the same serfs of the Lord and they could have this career for which the Lord maybe trusted this serf and uh, these serfs and their families were actually living into the Dominicum very often within the same um, uh, seniorial uh, household, and these for the, these were men of trust. Mm -hmm. Think about the uh, even the same Carolingian trustis, you know, it, it essentially derives exactly from that. So it's something that he, here you see it's very um, transversal, temporally. There was always this kind of idea that was someone who helped you, a uh, helper, also because when the, the professionalism of war entails someone who helped you as a fighter uh, he, hence the the the, the uh, how do you do you, the squires and all these uh, field assistants and so on excuse me drink a little once again but the idea is that as, as long as your family was uh, trusted and you basically had been serving your lord for for many uh, generations your family had been serving your lord for many generations and so on uh, these serfs may basically made a career um, into this office and sometimes were appointed even to rule over certain castles maybe for generations also in there so basically it would take root into these castles and maybe the, the original seigneurial family they depended on uh, other either died out or uh, uh, you know it they they rebelled maybe and they they started becoming uh, um, uh, lords on their own also in here the idea of lordship was pretty fluid there was no clear this was a, a defining moment there wasn't any clear rule any clear definition in fact the, the term viscount, vice count, essentially that is, that is present in many uh, many families uh, in um, a feudal Europe that also rose to, to great power. Um, probably the, the most famous one are the Visconti in, in Milan, uh, but uh, it's full of that. You know, viscount it actually came to be a proper you know ladder into the uh, into the feudal. Uh, you know, into the fuel on hierarchy also as as a title. Well, it, it basically most mostly originated from that, from this kind of ministeriales, from these uh, serfs that were appointed as administrators and eventually rose to the top. And in the case of Germany, it's very interesting because 
you realize first of all that as we were saying before that these weren't really military men or not necessarily military men in origins these were just administrators like uh, ministeriales is uh, also has the, the same root of uh, administration in fact it means uh, ad minus basically in latin so th th it's the person who's delegated to take care of the l minor business mm. so uh, that's ad, ad adminis Trator, you know, so that literally the one who is delegated to the rule of the lesser thing. So uh, these weren't just necessarily knights, and maybe at the beginning they they were sent there just like you know common civilians in many ways. But it, it's the political and, and and military practice of the time that naturally made very often these properties subject to intrinsic risk that were usually fortified. It could be a castle, so whoever was ruling in there could basically transform over time into a sort of uh, military commander of sorts, and therefore acquiring also this skill in 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 military affairs. So the ministeriales had in Germany especially had this this kind of even miserable b origin and many of them even where there were individually entrusted castles um uh, they had a pretty bad life you know I don't know if you imagine what a you know an average german castle in the 11th or 12th century could be you know just a a, a basically a tower with you know all you know precariously built and so something like that and and literally they would spend their lives in there um th there are similar um uh, you know it happens similarly in other parts of europe especially in this more f from frontier like areas think about the the byzantine akritai for instance so who lead into these for small fortresses at the borders M so many of them were also westerners who were already kind of used to that lifestyle and they were developing a sort of feudal lifestyle in many ways so the ministerialists progressively became knights and it, it's cal it's being calculated that like uh, in the mid 13th century like uh, in southern germany uh, i think 90 percent of the knights were ministeriales in fact so basically in certain areas like austria for instance these were becoming de facto the real military class for which there had been a, a higher nobility a higher aristocracies like in that case of austria the babenberg um, uh, that were kind of the big guys you know at the top the ones who basically owned the, the duchy of austria and so on and they were wealthy and and there and then there was all this military class that was by virtually all composed by ministeriales and this was very interesting because it, it definitely entailed that uh, the ministeriales had also a very strong uh, local uh, route uh, at one point i mean when they ceased to be really you know uh, exchanged and sold and uh, you know the idea is that they were also pretty much rooted into the into the countryside so even though they were serfs uh, at that point especially by the 13th century you couldn't really treat them or consider them as such because they were definitely faithful there was this idea that um you know in inherent in the feudal relations that these guys had to obey to to, to the king to the right of the land and so on but they were essentially working as sort of aristocracy on their own and then eventually the ministerialist class went in fact to be uh, to lose meaning uh, as this kind of uh, serf-like class, you know, eventually also this was a class that underwent a great crisis as well during the 14th century. Um, a lot of you know things were messed up in Germany at that point. And some of them went fighting abroad, famously in Italy, foreign mercenary companies. But at that point, the ministerialists, I think, they don't appear anymore. Albeit, I, as far as I know, in the, in the in the Holy Roman Imperial Diet, there was at its, uh, at all times. Um, a kind of military uh, of uh, knightly uh, class that was represented during the diets uh, in the in the Holy Roman Imperial parliaments that maintain a certain uh, importance because uh, Germany uh, kind of uh, put a lot of emphasis on its knights as a, as a social component as an institutional component of the empire in, in of the kingdom of Germany at least so it's it would be interesting also to deepen that topic one day maybe we, we can we can do it um so but in spite of this survey origin that we've just observed uh, it it should be observed that exact uh, essentially by the the 11th century the 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 the, the craft 
the profession of, of, of arms, let's say, uh, was um, increasingly specialized. Now, uh, as um, the origins could be different, also the, say, the, the combat specialties could be different, originally speaking. Um, cavalry, as you know, developed over time. It was always the same thing. There were major, I mean, not major, but, you know, very important differences between, I don't know, an 8th century cavalryman and an 11th century cavalryman in Europe. Mm -hmm. The essentials were kind of the same, but there were so many different ideas. And the, uh, the first one is that, generally speaking, the individual heavy cavalryman uh, was becoming increasingly more expensive. Uh, in many ways, it was a uh, it was as we've said just now a very progressive. But generally speaking, the equipment was getting heavier uh, and more expensive. the The breeds, uh, the horse breeds, were becoming tougher, more expensive. Um, there was the need to to maintain also bodies of troops at once. This this is not um, to overlook because you know that physically speaking that you know one thing is actually feeding and maintaining let's say supporting one night in one place uh, and uh, you know maybe this person already lives there there is always a system that is already formed to, to do that another problem really is when you have start having 20 40 80 nights at a time and you have to also to to, to make them go somewhere to operate to fight to go go to war and locally you do not have the uh, proper uh, support you know lo logistical support so you need also to structure society t towards that um, direction this is very important because you have to consider the cost of a night in general at, at a social level and uh, I'm very tempted to make one video one day stressing the you know how much society really revolved around the equipment of knights literally everything I mean uh, from you know the peasant who had to work the craftsmen they had to produce the armor uh, and think of all the resources sheer resources I mean you know for, for just for building up a coat of mail took like uh, loss of farms basically to achieve that um, think about even the same at, at an ideological level you know you can't have a crusader if you don't stress if you don't um, educate him uh, in a Christian fashion if you don't uh, reinforce his faith so you need to have an, a, a clergy class that works that studies and in turn that means that there are people who are peasants read that they are working for them and so on so it was a society that a uh, Basically, especially at this point, really revolved uh, around the knightly craft in so many ways because it was a very big social cost. Even uh, the you know the the destiny uh, of the fate of a kingdom of a duchy of a prince or whatever was tied to to the to the um, to these knights. I mean, uh, in, in a battle of maybe you know uh, actually. A, just a few hundred knights it was already an enormous thing to, by the 11th century uh, you know could be decided that the fate of, of a whole chunk of Europe like because in, in those few hundred knights was concentrated the wealth of entire generation of work generations of work and this means that if that knight uh, got captured all the equipment went to the enemy uh, was was reinforced so you basically lost double time to think because not only you had lost the, the cost of producing that but also you had also to cope with guys who had basically took it to fight against you so you you, you inherently have also to to respond a reaction and then think also about the ransom uh, of those knights and the uh, the prob the political problems the attrition deriving from you know that uh, lord being captured and the, the 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 problems of the succession and that could trigger a bloody feud among the various uh, uh, male sons and all the problems so uh, that that's why you know this gives you a measure of how important the knight was at the time how everything basically revolved around him um, and how these were actually the rulers you know of the time it's as if you know in those but it's as if today we had our you know parliamentaries that went to war uh, and everything was based on a 
uh, well, obviously it's yeah, it's a very odd and uh, even inaccurate parallelism comparison. But mentally speaking, it's as if you know you you appoint someone not just f f to govern, but actually also to go to war, um, and that person individually goes to war. That would be interesting to do uh, for our politicians, like really to to go on the field of the wars. They they start to understand better how how it truly is. Uh, uh, I'm not an anti-war person, as you understand, it, ab absolutely not, but objectively, you know, there is sometimes a detachment between, you know, the political decision-making and the military element that, is that should always cooperate in many ways, because that's the only way to, to actually make accurate strategical uh, decisions. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. So this is very, very, very important to, to, to think. And uh, what was r really warfare at that time? Because this is also kind of interesting. Uh, well, mm, I would say definitely, uh, I think the majority of, of, um, of resources of warfare were invested in sieges. Mm. The siege is something inherently costly because uh, usually, uh, aside from the, f the combat, the, the assaults and so on, it, it, but it's really the fact of maintaining this, uh, you know, extremely costly ama um, amount of troops basically idling around a fortress for weeks, for months. Obviously, yeah, castles in the 11th century were nothing extremely uh, demanding. Naturally, these were even, you know, it was a contractation, maybe uh, a bargaining, with, you know, but to, to storm, uh, some others were stormed, or you could, ju you could just wait for them to basically run out of, uh, of supplies and to capitulate. But nevertheless, you had to commit that force. Also, the siege is kind of demanding because you have basically, you, you, know, uh, you can't um, s uh, besiege a uh, place just with knights. You need actually other troops like uh, peasants that have literally to surround the fortress because otherwise the, the fortress can be supply resupplied by, by the external and you don't want that. So that means not only the knights, they have to stay there and ensure that there are not sorties and also to to provide an ass, uh, you know, that there, those were the guys who actually stormed the place. But you also have to take uh, lots of uh, hundreds was not thousands of, of peasants to to, to 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 surround that fortress and in or not in order to to avoid it being uh, supplied by by, by the out from the outside and and that is also costly because those peasants are taken away from the work in the field and you have to compel them and it, so it's very it's very costly in, in many ways uh, other very mm, common operations were this that we kind of uh, Raids, uh, mostly uh, uh, you know, aimed at uh, pillaging and looting. Um, so uh, this uh, cavalry was best suited for this because th they could make this kind of blitzes, uh, so attacking very fastly and going away on horseback. So th this was definitely very difficult to counter, and it was in fact so widespread because it was really effective. And naturally, the strategical goal at that point was either was both weakening the, the enemy from an economical point of view. We have seen how important you know it is, you know, the agricultural resource. If you uh, burn all the fields or, or take it away all the uh, all the food, it's you know that's really a freaking problem. Uh, at the same time, it's remunerative, in fact, because you can't take look with you. Uh, not just agricultural resources or other stuff, but I don't know. You can't find warehouses, depots. Uh, you can enslave uh, the, the peasants and so on um, and, and this was very effective and you can imagine uh, these areas of Europe have ravaged by these constant assaults think about areas uh, I don't know in the Iberian Peninsula during the Reconquista you know these areas of central Spain basically became depopulated they were just maybe they were actually good for for uh, cultivation, but they were turned basically to pastoralism because there were, you know, the Christians and the Moors fighting uh, each other on the frontier constantly, and therefore that was a dangerous place. It was impossible to to, to have a stable settlement, and uh, this also influenced later the the 
uh, I made a video incidentally on exactly on that on transhumans in central southern Italy and in Spain during the late Middle Ages and that was in part triggered for Spain exactly um, by that uh, constant you know that sent uh, secular um, uh, war frontier war between the, the Christians and the Muslims in, in that in that pretty wide area uh, that was turned you know, like like into pastoralism because of that essentially um, naturally uh, seizing enemy cattle was a pretty remunerative things you know cows ships were definitely pretty uh, they were an asset at that time. Just think, I don't know. It, it took uh, sometimes hundreds of ships to make just a, a manuscript. Uh, so f think of all the poor ships that uh, have been slaughtered. And uh, I don't know whether uh, is it in English that ship is not is uncountable. Yeah, there were sheep. Li like yeah, it's plural already. Well, okay, ships are the 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 boats actually. Well, well, yeah. But um, just think about the the material. You know the the material cost of life at the time was uh, so um, pitch battles were definitely rare. Uh, pitch battles were freaking rare, and there was a lot of edits attached to them because objectively, if you live in this world where all you see is all these raids and uh, ambushes and uh, small fights and so on, uh, that could be pretty deadly. In many ways, I mean, you have the idea that you know, if I really have to die, because you know, the craft of the knight at that time was pretty, pretty risky uh, business. You know, is it better to go, you know, in, in a big pitch battle where, uh, you know, at least it's a hell of a way to go? Uh, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, definitely, and th therefore the uh, the great pitch battles, albeit rare, uh, were definitely joined by 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 so many people who wanted to prove actually their own uh, their own strength their own um, their own prowess their own courage in front of in front of everyone because also consider at this time that all this nobility basically knew each other I mean at the regional scale level I think everybody knew you know who was who in there uh, heraldry and uh, you know recognition system had not been really much developed but they can everybody kind of knew each other that's the reason um, so it was not necessary at the time uh, um, also by the way this this uh, family is kind of intermarried con continuously so also among um, enemies because the political balance was so precarious you could be f uh, friend and enemy at the same time uh, I mean different uh, I mean not in the same time but in different contexts sometimes even at the same time because it really depended I mean maybe you had your neighbor enemy then a guy your right wanted to seize both of you you have to to get together to to, to fight uh, against that so it it was that complicated and it was a very strong, even familial relation, in fact, through these marriages and, and so on. That's why it also the, the conscience of a military class was strengthened by these women being exchanged uh, among these families for, for creating this patrimonial, uh, matrimonial slash patrimonial uh, assets that, uh, that were quite important also to, to make a fortune. Uh, sometimes you know, just remember that feudal law uh, was all about also this idea of you know owning properties that uh, the, the owning the land was really the base at that point. Uh, pitch battles were rare essentially because there were uh, rarely um, such major p political driving factors that required. Uh, that that even could manage to put so together so many people at once, the great um, pitch battles at this point were essentially uh, things like you know if you take Hastings, it's pretty when 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 a whole country invaded another um, at a, a so at a regional level kind of thing and and at a provincial level troops were really a few even. At, Actually, a big battle for those time standards could be, in fact, already something like you know, 80 knights versus 80 knights. It was already pretty, pretty big, objectively. But you really needed a reason for doing it. And uh, albeit complicated, this world really didn't put into motion a, a huge amount of, uh, um, of uh, you know, it wasn't extremely dynamic in the sense that 
it was very costly to move the war as we've seen so even putting together all these troops for once really there had to be some good reason for doing it and these good reasons were not um, inherently because they were too risky you know if they had been systemically so it was better to solve matters at a local level with a much more cunning um, and you know strategy with much more patience bit by bit than you know risking all in one shot but definitely sometimes it was worth the pain Hastings is definitely a good proof of that uh, like the Dukes of Normandy basically seized the whole uh, Anglo-Saxon kingdom it's not really a few and that's incidentally how they became more powerful even there than their French king so it's it's not to be forgotten um, so at this uh, this warfare basically brought um, it kind of shaped new uh, combat techniques in some ways that uh, at this time many people emphasized that they were based on the individual fight uh, I don't know well for which reason actually what I would like to stress on the contrary is that this was a, a, a moment in which there was a brutal acceleration of the um, collective training and that's what the knights were really conceived for I mean it is true I individually speaking uh, the knights were definitely extraordinary these were men that were still kind of halfway between the ancient tribal warrior who knew the, the nature who knew the places the uh, you know and and the you know full feudal you know specialized technical and uh, individual let's say but probably that's th the biggest difference in this sense is what collective training made what really now uh, knighthood was really famous for is that they could f fight on the battlefield like a unique mass of, s of 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 heavy cavalry that basically could not be opposed uh if you think about it this is very fascinating i mean today we we have you know uh, aside from atomic bombs and stuff like that but you know think about planes tanks chapters uh, something like that you have something that really smashes everything in at the time uh, you know if you were an armored uh, warrior well you already represented something you know there was nothing really in the world who could stop you uh, you know it's as if you had to fight against a tank today uh, you know what is that it's a pretty freaking problem uh, you know you you don't have I mean, to fight against a tank as an individual. So yeah, you have RPGs, you have uh, you know missile launchers, stuff like that. But uh, you still have to risk. So that that was the night. Also, because something is ov very often overlooked is that the panoply, especially armor, uh, that was developed historically at, at, uh, up to the the 16th century, was actually something pretty effective against everything could be thrown at you. I mean, it was freaking difficult to kill someone wore a male armor like even arrows at this point were di didn't have you know they, they weren't had and they didn't have such a high degree of penetration if you really wanted to pierce through mail you had to be a freaking strong guy with a double hand uh, uh, axe that came at close quarters with the armored guy but at the same time was defending himself with with pretty effective weapons and trying to even to break into the mail uh, so you can imagine, w and this just individual soldier, just imagine what what the the difference that could be made by squadrons of uh, forty, of eighty knights together. I mean, it's it's an unstoppable force. This is what basically also sources at that time were stressing. I mean, the idea that there was no way to to stop these guys, that their charge was unstoppable. Uh, at this time, infantry was still somewhat, you know, uh, functional. If you look at St. Hastings, basically the Norman cavalry was some of the best of its time uh, because it was a French cavalry, exactly. So even the French kings, this is often overlooked, they had the same identical quality of cavalry, for instance. Uh, but, you know, in Hastings, if, if, if the Anglo Saxon shield wall had not broken downhill because they thought the Normans were fleeing, at least from what we can know about it. They they could still resist to that, and there are even in Germany, uh, in pla in those places where really feudalism had not really emerged, and where especially the environment, the ground, the nature was pretty uh, unsuited for cavalry combat. You find that infantry retained uh, a substantial importance. 
uh, in many ways. It was still, as we were saying before, it's really the 13th century, the, sec the century where infantry is at, at its, not really at, at, at its lowest in absolute terms, but the moment in which basically a, a cavalry was superior in relative terms to, to the, the, you know, at the highest um, against the uh, against infantry in relative terms in fact so it's quite interesting because by th by the way in the 13th century naturally also also infantry had evolved was kind of stronger than the one of the, of the 11th for instance but uh, still cavalry was at the top in this 11th century you still find substantial um examples of uh but not very frequent uh, of infantry who could withstand the, the impact of of, of heavy cavalry and stuff like that but a reason for which by the way at this point cavalry was still equipped with with javelins consistently just think about hassings because, because the idea was also a matter of softening up the enemy formation before you know trying to break it which is was normal you know cavalry charges were rarely actually impacting the enemy there were usually feints to test you know the psychological um resilience of your uh, of your foe and you know you wouldn't risk even cavalry formations rarely actually impacted one against the other you know you really needed very strong and determined um, troops to do that and it was a kind of a mess also that was also pretty risky because you know you have basically it's as if you you smashed against a wall at 80 kilometers per hour so you you understand that most actually of, of the same horses would, would refrain from from this to happen in some way but this is important the collective training you know stay in a compact thickly compact mass of calorie men that can smash into you and that is that is the point it's mostly a psychological thing it's not really a physical thing for the reasons that we just explained because also if you are on horseback you really are not so eager to smash against something at that speed uh, but it's a psychological effect and throughout all military history what you see objectively is that uh, you know, it's the only side of cavalry that makes you freak out. Like uh, m watching that amount of, of troops like charging together straight at you, uh, you you uh, you lose it. Uh, most of these guy of of fighters at that time couldn't couldn't. You know, it, it's devastating. It's freaking devastating. There is this anecdote uh, of uh, that uh, make every time and when they shot in the seventies the movie uh, Waterloo. Uh, they uh, that was a uh, interestingly a uh, Western and uh, Soviet produ joint production. So basically, the Russians sent uh, the Red Army to uh, to to make to to serve as actors as figures for 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 the for for the Napoleon those armies, uh, and. Uh, they uh, it was interesting because naturally you know if you ever watched the movie you understand that there's a bit of an organization so these were already soldiers they knew what they had to do how to move and were trained and so on and when they shot the scene of the charge against the British squares uh, at Waterloo the the, uh, the the problem there is that when they shot the scene obviously <laughs> that was you know the, nobody had to charge anyone you know straight uh, but the only approach uh, of uh, that amount of cavalry uh, was basically uh, uh, you know that there were so many soldiers uh, of, of the Red Army that there that they couldn't stay in line because they were freaking out in front of of, of that cavalry approaching and that w and, and they knew that they would have not attacked them nevertheless they couldn't hold the, their nerves and those were the same people who uh, during World War II on the Eastern Front were attacking with bare hands and Molotovs and stuff like that the 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 the, the German Panzers. So um, if you think that uh, modern war is scary and that that war was kind of uh, less intense and less brutal, well, you you might want to reconsider this. I mean, it, it it is true, generally speaking, that of course modern probably modern warfare is more. Uh, is more shocking especially on the long run because we have technologies and uh, um, also material that it is employed in a fashion that the main problem is that you don't sleep during constant tension and stuff like that but um, even a bombardment uh, you know you have to think being charged by cavalry is something really devastating 
and it, it, it's it's not really so easy that of course yeah it kind of stops there as we were saying also uh, it didn't happen every day you had to withstand an enemy calendar but just think about how also psychologically uh, shaped and influenced were these uh, nights and people who lived in those times because of all the violence the brutality the you know that's really that's really a freaking a freaking problem uh, in uh, living in that world and not just because of nightly violence but generally speaking for how society was really violent by itself uh, at the time um, talking about uh, the nightly equipment uh, as um, we've always said didactically in, sh uh, in Schwerpunkt the, the equipment evolves according to the tactics and not vice versa uh, at least you know equipment usually has a very uh, low influence on the uh, tactics it's never technology that um, evolves by itself but it's you know the effort of, of certain to meet certain demands that brings to the active development of technology so the knights at this point were specializing into the use of a weapon that up to that time had been considered usually secondary that was the spear uh, or better the lance sorry so this was this uh, long uh, wooden shaft with this uh, spike at the top uh, a point in, in metal uh, at the top that was now held horizontally uh, in the couche grip so usually under your armpit to basically point better at the at the enemy and to also to absorb better the hit because in fact you know knights charged at something like 40 45 kilometers per hour so just imagine the the impact that the, the forces that, that are involved in, into such a warfare with a guy that basically is charging at you at 40 45 kilometers per hour at the same time that's why before I was saying it's as if you you have to smash against a, a, a wall at 90 kilometers per hour you know so you you don't really want to impact you want to absorb the shot so also the lungs that was the, the only part of you that hopefully hit the enemy was um, you know was held you know in your armpit so that you know it could be pushed um, backwards without you being wounded sensibly but we know at this time that there were uh, there is a Muslim source from Spain, for instance, that says that that, that uh, Christian knights at this point were literally anchored at the saddle, uh, sometimes keeping the saddle, you know, with stripes that went uh, twice or thrice around the 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 horse belly because uh, to to keep literally the, the the knight tied to the horse because if that guy had uh, you know impacted at those speeds he would have got literally catapulted out of the, out of the horse and um, mortality on horseback was something you know pretty much evident uh, and still today I mean riding a horse is a freaking, da a freaking dangerous <laughs> thing um, um, but um, and it's also a danger because if you're really anchored to the saddle you basically have problems you know if if your horse gets killed you remain barred under it and you can't move and you can be butchered down in some way so this happened many times in history as well that was the fortune of the peasants by the way it was the, the greatest shame for a knight ever was to be killed by peasants but usually you know a knight by itself could fence off like tens of peasants without many problems um, given his equipment but it happened also that these guys could take you down um, so this passage to the couche grip in uh, mounted combat is, you know, you can't, I, I don't know if you have, uh, I don't know if you have ever read uh, through the bibliography that exists on this, but it, it's one of the most debated things in military history, medieval military history at least. Uh, and it's been probably overly emphasized because telling the truth, and especially by the 11th century, knights used lances in the in all the possible ways there was no standard usage of a lance and whoever thinks there was a standard use of a, of a lance can't we, we leave him to war games and and, uh, and not to reality because the, the problem is at, at all times in history every single knight has done every single possible thing with a lance that is crochet grip overarm grip underarm grip uh, throne everything everything and actually if you look at lances that were used at this time as we were saying before there were also many javelins that were 
javelins slash lances, some of them weren't even properly distinguishable. Let's say now that just there is the tendency, the trend to you know to specialize instead in this kind of crochet grip, and and that was functional, in fact, to the uh, to make you understand better if, if you have difficulty to picture what I'm, you know the, what the point is is that the crochet uh, grip is uh, is functional obviously to the collective charge or to the charge in itself. I mean the idea you have to minimize even the space if you think of it. Consider that knight's charge, you know, uh, basically shoulder to shoulder, knee to knee. And they were extremely compact. And um, but obviously, if this guy had to fight uh, individually, he would pass to the sword. Uh, he would also dismount. By the eleventh century, uh, cavalry was heavy cavalry was not specialized enough to uh, to be an all. Uh, just for for heavy charge, it's 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 mostly towards the 13th century onwards that basically the the heavy cavalryman tends to be only that this ultra heavy elite that basically da is meant to do only this devastating charge and battlefield at some point while the other troops are specializing in other containment roles in other activities. Uh, at this point, really, d d by the 11th century, the knight mounted and dismounted constantly. Also, because the equipment was was uh, less, uh, that's the reason why the, the equipment also was lighter, as a general indicator. And the reason was that at this point, especially, uh, warfare was kind of a uh, less. Uh, it has had a low s as a system had a low cinetic energy. I mean, the heavening of the widening of the uh, knight armor is something that happens also because there are start to be things like crossbows around pikes so the guy gets increasingly heavier and that's what brings him to be all confined to certain tactical roles because he's literally too heavy for he and his horse to 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 do certain things he could do before this time in the 11th century you know uh, infantry was still a thing as we've seen so this guy could also dismount and very often the infantry we, we see in, ba in these battles the tough infantry we see in battles were at the same time dismounted knights um, but let's say that socially speaking there was no other major competitor to the knight uh, most of the times and therefore the, the knight was a bit multitasking uh, in this this is the general concept so it was pretty easy. It, it was a pretty dynamic combat. Could really be, you know, if you look at, uh, I think one of my favorite historical characters is uh, Harold Godwinson. Um, very often it's said that uh, you know the Anglo-Saxons, uh, because there is just, I think, uh, Geraldus Cambrensis states that you know Anglo-Saxons arrived uh, on the battlefield on horseback and then dismounted. So they didn't fight on horseback because it was against their tradition or something like that. That's kind of garbage, if you really want to be honest. I believe Anglo-Saxons definitely fought on foot pretty extens uh, on horseback pretty extensively as well. Uh, many uh, factors were contingental. Like you know, if you want to defend, definitely the best is to fight on on foot. But also it depends what you have to do. So even great battles, as as yeah, there is a systemic um, greater emphasis for for infantry in the Anglo-Saxon world than the Norman one. It's pretty evident. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons had not been Frankishized, but Harold Godwinson is a beautiful example of a guy who could fight. In who uh, was malleable, who was adaptable. So uh, he could fight like a perfect Anglo-Saxon warrior. Uh, whatever it was on foot and, and however they were trained and, and so on they could he could fight on horseback perfectly well because he was uh, perfectly he went to France he fought on horseback we know that he, he was he was acquainted to cavalry knew how to use heavy cavalry use a, knew how to use and so on he fought in Wales against the Welsh that had this uh, you know Wales pretty tough terrain these guys were specialized kind of in, in guerrilla tactics and so on he basically uh, arranged his own Anglo-Saxon uh, cavalry uh, infantry to fight into that fashion, lighting up the equipment, gaining, you know, uh, to coping successfully with the enemy. So you see here that these guys were capable of doing literally everything, and if they did one thing instead of another, you don't have to think like 
a freaking idiot of the 21st century that you're best because you understand how you know th th these guys were stupid because they were doing something that you don't understand and they, yeah no these guys if they did fight in some way it's because they had a freaking valid reason that you can't even imagine because we don't know a lot about that unfortunately but uh, uh, yeah adaptability was the key word in here and this adaptability derived essentially by the professionalism of arms you know the idea if you train all your life with all weapons with all fa this idea that for instance uh, cavalry didn't didn't use missile weapons it's a tr it's false that's mm, that's medieval chivalric propaganda knights made extensive use of bows and crossbows um, this is pretty notorious uh, if anything because these guys um, knew all how to hunt uh, to how to use the bow on horseback it was the activity of every, uh, every aristocrat at the time they knew how to use every single weapon they knew how to to cope with any kind of situation their life revolved around war it's as if you spent your whole freaking life on horseback and thinking at how you can defeat an enemy that's literally it that was literally their lives and it was a pretty tough life as you can understand but it's it was that toughness that shaped uh, in quite pragmatical rational ways uh, the way that they had to fight and naturally there were certain cultural limits that you know but at this point these were not you know a, a real problem because there, there weren't so many different enemies you had to fight so essentially yeah you fight you find in 13th century how the Mongols uh, embarrassingly uh, how embarrassingly easily the, the Mongols defeated uh, European knights uh, on, on the battlefields but you know those were literally coming from the other you know uh, thousands and thousands of kilometers away completely different society completely different culture um, at this time your enemy was essentially a copy of yourself there was virtually no difference so these guys were perfectly fine the way they did and by the way consider that uh, even Western knights at this point were kind of uh, um, successful also in environments that were not really the ones they were habituated to. I mean, when the, the Franks arrived into the Near East during the Crusades, well, you know, the Muslims had a, a tough, a, a hard time. I mean, even the Byzantines recognize these guys, even though they had developed their warfare basically only into Western Europe. Now they they which is also an approximation because of course there were westerners that fought all over the world at that point um, I mean not literally but you know in Eurasia and North Africa there was plenty of western mercenaries and stuff like that but I mean they had structurally developed that warfare essentially only in the uh, post carlingian world um, and wherever Frankish feudalism had been expanded and yet there were uh, a, a freaking tough nut to crack for you know for these other peoples that you know they weren't excess radically different in warfare and so on but you know they they, they, they substantially fought in kind of different ways so uh, very often uh, there is also this kind of defeatism that I don't know where does it stem from that the idea that Westerners can't cope with guerrilla and so on this is a typical in fact Westerns <laughs> prejudice that is not grounded not even in the experience of the West um, the idea that you know faint flights and ambushes and are can, things you can't really win guerrilla can't really be won it, it's um, it's a myth it's a big myth that I don't know I think it's mostly an American made myth really because of the Vietnam War and also because of um, you know the, the necessity you know the, thinking about the American Revolution this idea that it's guerrilla that makes it where yeah we made it because we're guerrilla no not really uh, uh, it, it, it didn't happen like that I mean and I don't absolutely want to diminish the the American uh, you know the American Revolution is one of my favorite chapters in absolute terms I'm really sympathetic I love the um, you know I, I love the, the, the American Constitution it's uh, the way it emerged from I, I'm, I'm a, I I love that kind of I love the minute men and so on but um, there is a kind of a mindset that that has been, you know, in fact, me, that misuses that historical experience that uh, by saying, you know, it, it's all about guerrilla. It's essentially uh, war is uh, you can win war essentially just by holding a gun, 
and uh, making ambushes and so on. No, because it's countless, uh, there are countless examples into history of, you know, guerrilla that has been successfully defeated by, uh, and not, uh, and even in the 20th century by Western countries. So it, it's, you know, it's, it's not like that. War is not reduced to tactics. If anything, tactics are the least important thing that make a war being won or not, and it has nothing to do with that. So actually, um, and this is interesting because the point I was trying to make, however, is that this uh, kind of warfare was surprisingly effective also for other uh, wars, uh, for, for the war standards at, of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not uh, something to give, be given for granted that a guy like uh, Godfrey of Bouillon who had been raised and lived in Belgium uh, out one day out of the blue organized a freaking uh, order expedition to, to, to Palestine and managed to, to conquer Jerusalem. It's, it's not something you give for granted. It's a clamorous success. Of course they were lucky. F of course they were lucky, but uh, it still proves that it could be done and that this military, Western military system was, um, was pretty effective in the way it was being developed. Um, um, what else can we talk about? So, um, the, uh, the, the ob ob naturally the objective of these cavalry charges was to uh, mm, basically uh, smash the, the uh, now it's we can't waste time explaining how medieval tactics work. I, I, I actually made already one video about it and I don't remember how it's called but it should be like war tactics and feudal Europe, something like that. If you, if you go in the medieval um, warfare playlist, you should find it without without problems. So it's, but uh, because also how understanding how these tactics worked, uh, I mean, in the essentials is pretty easy, but until you don't get it clear, it's, it's not so intuitive. So uh, mostly because we don't live like that <laughs> anymore, but otherwise it's kind of, uh, everything is very logical. Uh, so these tactics entailed the development of new uh, gear, uh, chiefly armor, and uh, so mail. Uh, you know, listen, it was an improvement at this time. Also, met metallurgically speaking, for other reasons that are very much intertwined with you know socio-economical dynamics, but also the creation of new types of helms. You know, there is all an evolution. I think, incidentally. I will talk about this soon, Schwerpunkt as well. Shields as well that were modifying, getting best best suited for mounted combat and certain type of armor. So, um, as a result, however, and this is perhaps the most important thing, is that this equipment was becoming increasingly more costly. So, the the idea is that the this that there was a kind of an entrepreneurial nature of warfare. Like warfare is very entrepreneurial because, you know, the, the major moves of, of warfare is, uh, you know, it, the major objective is gaining resources. Let's be honest about this. So um, this was the idea that the war fueled the... Um, it w was a great business and, and who came out of it alive was coming out of it wealthier. So, uh, the in, in parallel with this uh, technological, you know, relatively modest technological developments, there was the um, the true the this uh, spectacular actions of war, the personal success of knights, and uh, as a consequence, the uh, rapid growth of their own prestige. So. The same training of war is was crucial, as we've seen. Uh, these guys really trained all their lives. How did they train? Well, by the 11th century, uh, you say, well, uh, the tournaments, yes. Uh, there was something like that. It was an indiv individual training as well. I think the knight was, uh, you know, knights were... S these guys were trained, uh, uh, you know, from seven years old, essentially, to be around knights. And uh, it was a pretty tough world can imagine things like abuses, violence, uh, it was a very, and this was also paradoxically functional to the psychological toughening of these people, like a really al analyzing, psychoanalyzing an 11th century knight might be one of the most fascinating things of all, 
but was nevertheless freaking terrible time. These people were psychologically devastated in, in many ways. Nevertheless, you know, the, where you were a child, you were taken away from your mother, your thing, you were um, start following uh, as a an assistant as the a knight then became uh, you know were progressively acquainted I think into your early uh, teens into to, to actually the violence of war like uh, um, a squire then eventually becoming a knight uh, at a point and getting to the full um, business of, of blood in, in, and by that point um, so this was also aimed to to de to develop a sort of esprit de corps with the uh, with other knights with the retinues. Usually, it was normal to, to especially for you know to send. In fact, these children were sent to the uh, houses of other knights. So the, here there were political connections between the various families that uh, obviously reinforced. It. Sometimes these these kids were kind of hostages. In practice, even the king wanted to control the nobility through that. It was something that existed since the early medieval times, really. It was the idea of the hostage that also learns about warfare. It's something you find even thinking about Arminius with Rome. He, he was freaking raised in Rome, guys. He, w he was German, but uh, and, and that was it. You know, the idea of learning also the, the craft of war is very, very important. And uh, it, it this contributed, that mil the military definitely contributed to the uh, strengthening of this military, uh, you know, this uh, feudal aristocratic conscience, because they basically they all came from the same stock. This was the the idea that it was reinforced that this was a, a privileged class that did this. Well, it wasn't privileged at all if you think about it, because living a, a life of war, yeah, you can be rich, you can own castles and properties and so on, but uh, you know you have to fight it through all your life. So even this idea of privilege is pretty, it's pretty relative and debatable. Well, surely being a, a peasant who had his uh, family slowed, uh, raped and slaughtered and his fields destroyed by his knights were arguably worse, but uh, still wasn't an, an easy life uh, in general for knights as well. And however, the, when, you know, in adulthood, the main um, training really occurred through the so-called tournament, tournaments. Now, the uh, typical tournament like the joust with the fence in the middle uh, is something really late. At this time it didn't exist at all. That's something that started coming from the 14th, uh, 15th century. That's really ac actually at the end of the Middle Ages, actually in the early modern age in some cases. Uh, tournaments in the 11th century, this is, uh, I can't stress this enough, were the same exact thing as battles. As a matter of fact, they were battles. There was no difference of any sort. You can't find a single difference. They were the same identical thing. They were real battles where people died, where people broke their bones, and crushed their feet, and, and so on. And, and, and that was it. They were organized usually into uh, a um, basically, uh, obviously, uh, a war was considered as a spectacle in the first place. So it's not a tournament was a spectacle and war not. So here you see that they were identically the same thing. Basically, there were two sides. There were, could be two um, rival bands of warriors, like I don't know, th yeah, uh, two neighboring, uh, you know, f families uh, uh, that uh, wanted just uh, the baby. Yeah, they had uh, even in here. You can't really distinguish from war in itself, but sometimes they did it just to for fun. So among people that might be. Uh, in competition, the one with each other, because yeah, it was also a matter of prestige and proving who was the strongest. This was a, a matter of also of of military testing. You know, in, in this war dominated by by warfare, it, it is important to test uh, even in times of peace what's the the strength of the enemy, because time of peace is usually very short. So you have to know what what you know. If there was a battle, a real battle, a real war, say one against the other, for how would it be? Uh, who was stronger? You know, th th there was much to prove, really. So what these guys were, they were just uh, dating each other by saying, okay, let's meet at that, uh, in that place. 
usually they would choose a place where it's fitting for you know uh, combat uh, cavalry combat usually but not only they could be you know um, you know th 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 there were farms and villages and incidentally <coughs> excuse me for the fun of these guys there were entire um, cultivations devastated for no reason peasants dispossessed and uh, butchered that you it, it was really that freaking uh, yeah, the, the, this feudal elite were, were real jerks, uh, and it, it is true. Um, they would simply fight one against the other, and uh, usually um, mortality was pretty low. And not because this was a tournament, but because generally speaking, and this is perhaps a, a bit of a cliche, because I, I suspect mortality was not low at all, at least. But if you look at the elite objectively, yeah, the, the elite tended, for the reasons we have explained before, not to really kill each other. That was not uh, was not a profitable thing to do. Uh, these guys were covered in, ar in in iron. They were difficult to kill in the first place. Secondly, um, there was a um, a general you know, especially when these tournaments were not in time of war. You know, why why killing someone? It was you know, not so much. Even being captured, these uh, guys did it mostly for the ransom because during tournaments there were enemies that were you know, enemies, I mean, this, the opponents were captured, and then it was like betting. There were large bets on it, and the ransom was the, the prize, essentially, was the, 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 the win. Um, and that's how they had fun, <laughs> essentially. And, and, we, and, and mortality was low, for the reasons we have explained. Uh, into battles, probably mortality was, I mean, it was, I mean, in tournaments, mortality was relatively low. Sources tell us that there was no tournament without some death of some sort. Naturally, there were lots of people who came out of it with broken bones and so. By the way, sometimes you never really get from these sources is you know the amount of crippled people that existed at the time, and especially for someone who fought. You know, we we know that there were knights that fought until they were eighty years old. But just think, you know, eighty years old, of which uh, at least you know uh, sixty are spent fighting. You know, what's your clinical situation like you know what's the, the real the part of your body that you have not consistently destroyed uh, nevertheless uh, yeah this fight would happen in such fashion battles were arguably bloodier perhaps be because th there were other troops participating to the battle usually like peasantry levies and stuff like that maybe during tournaments weren't really uh, brought up all the time. I mean, it could be definitely the tournaments, so the participation of the infantrymen and other people who wanted to join uh, to share the ransom. You can't imagine that this was a very dirty play uh, indeed. And uh, so, uh, once again, differences in, in actual combat, especially between this and war, were, were non existent. Um, but there were some rules of some sort that were actually also used into real battles. I mean, th this elite had been developing essentially a sense of uh, of pride, of, ident uh, of identity, as we've said, that basically said, okay, th let's fight, but even in war, let's not fight in really in the worst ways. For instance, something considerably famous was killing your opponent's horse. Because horses at this point were really not armored, and throughout all the Middle Ages, just a tiny part of them were the very elite, numerical elite was armored um, at all times. They had gambas on and stuff like that, but uh, you know it was very infamous to kill one's horse because the horse was even something. It was an emotion, a sentimental attachment to the horse. Like if you're a knight, you have your own horse. You you trust the horse. The horse trusts you. You basically. Um, save each other's lives in, in common. So there was this very strong um, effect. You, you have, in, in the world of knights, it was also a very weird uh, psychological thing about affections. Like these were people who literally cut children to pieces and and yet could break up into tears when there were sung stories of dames of uh, these female figures that recalled them that their mothers their sisters of when they were killed ch children and uh, they were that messed up psychologically and the that is also normal i mean we know what patterns the, that behavior follows objectively uh, but in general also this th th there were certain rules that were shared in this sense and war 
has, has always been by certain degree ritualized. I mean, there has been, there is arguably, you know, gallantry and courtesy and chivalry are obviously very ideal, very propagandistic at all times. Um, unfortunately, we know the world of cavalry mostly through these ideals that were often portrayed uh, by artists like, you know, uh, historians, singers, uh, painters. Um, think about the nuns who weaved all the Bayeux tapestry and all this. In, in this very celebrative and idealized fashion. Just think about the Minnesenga. Uh, think about, I don't know, one of the best uh, pictures we have for um, a medieval panoply is the Manessa code that, yeah, shows you this beautiful armor, but, you know, depicts scenes that are very, very idealized and inspired to chivalric epics, all these things, with the kind of a angelic figure of knights in many ways, and but it was a very crude world, and what we don't see is often also what, how we can't really grasp is how much these ideals of, you know, being, of... Uh, of individual fight for uh, of duel almost in which you know who was defeated claimed to be each other's pr uh, the other the opponent's prisoner and to be you know just ransom i mean warfare was as brutal as you can imagine that was just an ideal but at the same time there were some rules that were functional for instance the idea of not killing it didn't come really from the idea that these people didn't each other uh, didn't hate each other these people wanted to kill each other all the time. If you study what these guys did from these sources, you can understand how much hatred and violence and and it ex and evil, because that's also in part, I, I, I usually don't use this word, but yeah, that's, you know, the bad side of na human nature that emerges from that. But they didn't kill each other because, why? Because it was more convenient to ransom. So this in turn was kind of uh, idealized as, you know, but these people were gallant with each other. Uh, they were really not, but still they did it because it was co more convenient for them to ransom than to kill. So this is how it happens, and you can argue that in, all vo in the history of warfare this happened in so many ways, you know, even the concept of fetus, of this, this loyalty that had to be through, it, it really stemmed from other reasons, even for instance this idea of meeting um, at a, a given place, a given time, that, that that is not not something you would normally do if you want to catch your enemy by surprise. But it's really the point. Sometimes armies, especially in the 13th century, started cavalry armies, especially were very logistically demanding. Got so big that the uh, you know objectively was easier to say, okay, let's deploy in that place and let's get it over with, because otherwise it, it would have been more costly even to, to get ruined, because you had to choose where, when to fight, because you feared the enemy to, to, to attack you or not in the meanwhile. It definitely could still occur, but sometimes it was more convenient, economically speaking, to behave like that than in another way. Um, so he, he, here's what's the, where's the ideal stems from, essentially. Excuse me, uh, well, so let, let's go on for now. Um, so, um, so this process that uh, you know, these several, you know, the rise of uh, the military class definitely uh, brought to the also of closing of of of, uh, of the knightly class in a sort of so a restrict a restricted social elite. Um, and the, uh, the the reason, uh, also an another part of this is that naturally being a knight, owning lands and castles and so on, became also a, you know, uh, kind of an ideal. It's as if, you know, now you, you want to make, you want to make money. It was plenty of people, or the adventure, or people who just wanted to, to make a fortune in that life because they had nothing to lose. Uh, being a knight, you know, starting the profession of arms could really be quite remunerative. It could be quite convenient, profitable, and so on. So, th there were so many people now that were fighting already as mercenaries, as people who sold their services around. And in fact, at this time, it's very difficult to distinguish the two things because mercenaries, as we know, have always existed ever. But what is really a mercenary? We have really pictured the idea of a mercenary as something. 
uh, neatly defined when we, we invented the 19th century um, nation-state. You have a state with an army that fights under a flag that uh, is a referential to that political entity. Well, before that there was nothing like it. I mean, er, uh, it was literally everyone who could fight and wanted to fight who could join. And there was no, not much difference but between the mercenary and the feudal levy, because objectively they were doing it, uh, negotiating it with the, the authorities. Um, so, uh, uh, however, the, the point uh, now, uh, this happened mostly at the political level for which every vassal kind of bargained its, his military service to the sovereign in his own fashion. It's a fascinating topic, but not really, you know, can't really ha don't really have the time now to, to talk about it. But w what I want to stress now is how much uh, is the rise of people from the bottom of society to, to, to participate in the craft of arms, and how already by the 11th century this business of arms was so international. Uh, the Crusades, for instance, weren't born out of the blue with Westerners setting foot for the first time, my god, after so many centuries in places like the Near East. Uh, it was full of Western mercenaries literally everywhere. If you, if you look at, um, if you watch that video I made of the Battle of Manziker, to realize it was full of Norman uh, knights in Armenia and places like, it, it was normal. They, they were making a business, the same Vikings had toured around. Uh, think about Harald of Drada that had, you know, before uh, invading Britain to ultimately die. Uh, at the Battle of uh, the s uh, uh, of the of Stamford Bridge, the uh, the the he had toured the whole Mediterranean, been in Crete, in Sicily. The, the knights traveled, people traveled. the The idea that the Middle Ages were was a moment where people didn't travel. Yeah, at, at large, usually peasants weren't much of travelers on the long run, but the market of war always brought people to to literally go everywhere at all times, and this is. This is very fascinating because uh, this also meant, by the way, how homogeneous really military culture was at that point. We like to stress differences like I did before, for example, saying, okay, look at Western warfare as, as if it was something well defined. But objectively, in the essentials, it was the same. It was existed in, I don't know, in the Byzantine Empire and in the Muslim world. I mean, they were all fighting with this kind of elite and this mounted elite. It was, it was like that pretty much everywhere. There were some kind of superficial differences, but the essentials were really, really the same. So, um, the important thing is now that you could think of making a living out of that craft outside. And um, there are two um, major uh, authors that studied this, that are two French scholars, uh, Duby and Fleury. Um, to be is great. Fleury, uh, yeah, I like him a bit less, but he's still great red, um, and he's probably even more keen on uh, strictly military stuff, but um, the, uh, the there is a huge bibliography on these topics um, that can be read, and then those mostly are uh, looking at fr the Frankish era, that however, yeah, I mean, it was mostly French dominated thing. We, we were saying before, so people like to distinguish the Normans from other knights. You know, there is, it's a bit, uh, I think, Anglo Saxon historiography that having had the Normans has wanted to distinguish them eventually from the French in, uh, also as a, uh, obviously not because we all know that Normans were French in practice, but the in language and culture and everything, in social, political and social structures. Uh, genetics has nothing to do with, with this, but the, the idea is that there was no, this is often overlooked, that there was no actual difference between the Norman knights and the French knights. I mean, uh, they were essentially the same thing. I, if anything, it had been the Normans who had learned to go on horse, to, to uh, to import Frankish feudal, Western Frankish feudalism, actually the ones who taught the Normans to, to fight well on horseback were the Bre the uh, the Bretons. Um, interestingly enough, also participated to the Norman conquest of England, by the way. But the important here is that the national distinction is a bit um, useless because um, the really the core the core of uh, of feudalism at this point was 
naturally the Frankish world broadly meant. So this thing that had been originated essentially north eastern France and in today's Belgium and something like that it had progressively spread from the Carolingian world and post Carolingian times now all over Europe. And when you want to trace a difference um, here, um, it's really more a systemic difference than an actual individual difference. Because even in places like we said before with Germany, where feudalism arrived kind of later in the mid-12th century, or in Italy where feudalism was kind of weak because there were the cities that were rising. But uh, what you find in there is uh, it's the institution of feudalism that could vary. But if you look at the individual knights, uh, basically from Poland to Portugal, from, uh, from, from Norway to Sicily, what you have is conceptually the same identical fighter, the same identical warrior. There is a striking homogeneity of Western knights um, in, uh, in, in this moment. As long as feudal, and uh, yeah, the, the indicator is the spread of feudalism and how this was um, kind of existing, but the, the, the Western knight is essentially the same everywhere, conceptually, even in mindset. Uh, yeah, you can argue, of course, the word difference is broadly meant. Before we talk about the German ministerialis, we can we send a serve, serve file class, but uh, in, in practice, in the essentials, especially from a strictly military point of view, they were practically the same. And if anything, the greater difference was posed by the, the level of individual uh, of collective training, because individually these were all, you know, tough guys. You know, every you can argue that there were differences, like maybe environmental ones, that there were countries where, you know, people were more or less warlike given the the, the situation where they were living. Yeah, it is partly true, but uh, what really made the difference is not the individual prowess, but is how intensely these collective formations of knights are trained. So that's why uh, the best knights were renowningly, uh, at this point in the 11th century, the ones from France, on northern France, because they were objectively the knights that came from the most f intensely feudalized world, where there were these very large retinues of troops that fought, that had more resources to fight, and, and did it all the time intensely, and did it in that fashion, and had this higher collective training. Later, this would be extended to England, uh, through the Norman conquest, then it progressively also in, in, in Germany. Uh, the, 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 there, were, there were these ideas of famous knights, not because they were individually better, but because they were, you know, they were more trained collectively. And this eventually blended old in, ultimately, in, especially in, la in low medieval times, because at that point it was not much, uh, you know, the social structures were pretty homogeneous in many ways. Um, and especially the market war was so much uh, standardized in, in, in many ways. Excuse me, I drink a little once again. There is also an increase during the 11th century of the actual number of noble uh, knights, uh, which is a uh, even partly indirectly a consequence of the affirmation in the uh, nobiliar milieu of of a fam family structure of vertical type that uh, on the example of what was happening in uh, in the royal families basically privileged the um, essentially the the offspring of uh, the paternal offspring and the firstborn uh, sons uh, before instead the aristocratical families had had a sort of horizontal familiar type, so wi by with a certain equally balance that existed between the parental, uh, uh, both the paternal and maternal parental lines, and by the absence of a clear uh, right for the firstborn. So th this means basically that um, at this time there is a, a, a progressive. Um, mm, favoritism towards the firstborn male sons, whereas in previous times, even if you look at the Carolingian world, the idea is that every son, according to the Germanic tradition, had to inherit exactly the same from his father, father's, um, um, you know, uh, um, her uh, hereditary, uh, what, what the hell am I saying? Okay, well, you understood what I meant. Um, so, this 
mm, this brought to a sort of internationalism because the more uh, society was verticalized in this uh, verticalized in this sense and the more there were um you know bonds at a at a uh, at a trans uh continental level i mean a trans regional level in the sense that you know if you you know if what is important for you is to marry with someone who is s close to you uh, who is similar to you and this person is close you will not go pick you know someone from another country but if you are you know the king of a place or however very important prince and you have so many interests at a long range you definitely want to intermarry with people who are of your same class but uh, from from a greater distance so this is this is important naturally and so with especially with the affirmation of the banal lordship um, several um, powerful families um, usually rooted themselves into the region where they owned their uh, castle and not to um, um, uh, and, and the majority of their uh, of their goods naturally and it was very important into this new context not to subdivide the patrimonial uh, uh, you know the, the familiar property basically because that was as you can imagine initially it was of relatively small dimension um, so the, the, the problem now is that uh, th they wanted to basically maintain the uh, the property their own property in the hands of only a few I mean they wanted to select the firstborn to say okay you are the one who basically keeps concentrated this wealth it was very important because it was inherently structuring now a um, a hierarchy you know the idea is that the other brothers were somewhat tied to you some would be mm, appointed as you know for the ecclesiastical career as abbots in the private uh, ecclesiastical monasteries foundations and something like that but the others were albeit cadets and albeit sent out there in the world as we were see it they were still they still had a point of reference because that was still your brother i mean of course um brotherly feuds existed uh, and of course they existed because exactly because it was difficult to eradicate that egalitarian mindset that wanted an equal splitting of the um of, of the father's uh, heredity in, into their hands um, in, in to the hands of each uh, male uh, son um, at the same time however it was structuring something more solid because the idea is that the, the the familiar patrimony doesn't get dispersed and you can build something that persists over time that is able to structure itself to enlarge itself and that's how the great feudal lordships at this time were were developing in many ways um, so th the, uh, the increasing discrimination towards uh, the sons basically brought to to this and the cadets the cadets that that is those who were you know were not the first born or however the last you know the first um, born sur you know the, the, the one who, had, who survived because naturally mortality was pretty high at that point there were many problems also if, you know if your brother older brother died without without hair so you you would pass naturally into the into the uh, hereditary line as the lord so there were sometimes even certain changes of uh, in uh, in careers stuff like that there were this problem uh, but let's say that the cadets were however a bit uh, they were discriminated and they would basically um, either receive a smaller part of the of, of the paternal property either actually nothing uh, sometimes um, at a personal level and they were in this sense um, forced by 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 uh, evidently to search uh, for uh, fortune far away from the paternal house and as we've seen before this was normally done since uh, since childhood so these were kids that were uh, kind of already sent away since they were young and they were brought into the world like in this brutal world that however 
could in this sense already open to them new opportunities at the service of some other lord who use them in this sense as mercenaries, as fighters essentially and um, under whom they, they, they uh, a lord under which they, they might obtain fortune in war in this risky business so it was a pretty tough uh, experience and naturally in fact this this is what they did the, the only craft they knew was the one of arms and they would basically maintain it what is interesting about this aspect is that even those um, sons who were uh, maybe sent you know to be clergymen etc they would maintain actually a very strong um, uh, military status I mean the idea even you see that you know the, the clergy was armed and uh, there was not much difference after all you, if you were an abbot a bishop you had your military retinues you conducted you led a military lifestyle and that was normal because this came ex essentially from the same aristocracy it's like you know and this started all in Carolingian times where you know it was the same aristocracy military aristocracies that you know fueled the ecclesiastical ones and the, the shared culture the common culture was essentially um, that one so it's uh, it's very important um, for instance, I made a video about Otto of Cluny and Gerald, uh, uh, Gerald of Aurillac that deals exactly with this. I mean, showing how, even at a cultural level, the clergy was pushing for the idea of the military saint at that point, as a, as a, you know, uh, trying to con reconcile sanctity with the use of arms. That was also very important. At, at this point, it's not completely connected. It's not all exclusively connected with this last thought, but um, it's still important because. It shows you how, in those times in, the, in which the military uh, military class was being forged, actually, uh, it, it was the whole society who was looking at these fighters and, you know, feeling them as part of uh, of the natural order, in so many ways. So it was not even so, you know, even the clergy was not so distant. Uh, was was not distant at all, as a matter of fact, from this lay uh, military man. So, at this point, especially characterizing the 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 clergy as something radically different from the lay from the late uh from the lay world is kind of wrong in, in so many ways. Um and as we have seen, you know, those knights who still had it was naturally a uh, a career, also a kind of experience of uh uh, of apprenticeship that knights had to do. The knights had to affirm themselves. They they also had to grow famous and all. I mean, this had always existed. You know, the, there was a very strong competition among the various retinues. The, the general Edis stressed that you couldn't be less than your feudal lord, essentially, in, in courage and in devotion and loyalty and so on. So this naturally entailed a, a a great deal of showing off. So these knight, this possessed knights would essentially go around um, the world uh, independently from their uh, social status. Uh, maybe we didn't stress it enough before, but anyone who had a sword, a horse, and uh, and a coat of mail, some other gear, could could be a knight proper. After could be used as such, also because as we've seen, these knights were paid now, were were hired, were uh, on the service of other people who could support them. So sometimes it was really enough to have won your equipment in some way. You know, we can imagine many peasants having maybe found the corpse of a knight, uh, you know, uh, drawn into a ditch, and they 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 took the weapons and started using them and went out there to, to be knights themselves. Um, it's full of stories like this. Uh, so the, the the deal would be essentially to travel, uh, you know, knight errands. You know, the idea of the knight errand is it starts exactly from this was where what were going these knights? What did they have to do? Basically nothing. We're just in uh, just in search for employment. So they traveled uh, court by court, city by city, participating to uh, to combats and tournaments to fights and tournaments and naturally the main 
their main aim was to build a new economical base uh, to 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 get married to to have a stable life this is after all not so different from our own world i mean even marriage was uh was intended for for this reason i mean uh, marrying the let's say a rich heiress or the daughter of a uh, of you know of a rich family who could endow their their daughters but pretty consistently was a, a good way for the knight to to make a f to make a good living um this often happened actually uh, many times in in history it happened there was this um kind of more military class that was either declining or dispossessed and so on and there were wealthier families even one of burghers by the way who could uh you know kind of ennoble by marrying the knight and the knight enriching by marrying the daughter of the rich uh, merchant it was a present all all, all the way and, we, and having seen how fluid and uh, nobility was conceptually this time there is nothing to, to be surprised of and that's the reason why so many knights eventually uh, uh, went living in two cities uh, take uh, communal Italy basically communal civilization was founded by the military class or originally speaking that this have, had been ruling in this so this is really fascinating because um, it was normally perceived as, as a normal way of, of living was still kind of elite I I on average you know meaning that the this lifestyle was kind of um, um, uh, still pertaining to those who had the means to to fight on horseback that was extremely expensive as we have seen but it was so very transversal it seemed very dynamic and fluent and the nobility was open to these other elements that had also to prove, you know, their own might, their own prowess, their own strength. Especially, consider now everything we uh, uh, we can't we quantify everything in money. But at the time, in a world where, you know, uh, life was risky and violent and so on, even, you know, making enter into your family someone who was a, a strong warrior, who was physically and and you know mentally and uh, physically and mentally strong enough to defend the the group the, the clan it was something important so even this uh, act of you know showing off in tournaments and etc uh, was functional a bit to, to that selection to the idea okay that's that's a tough guy i want that to 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 you know to marry my daughter because i don't have male sons i need someone who, who you know fights for me was faithful to me in some way so that really happened um, frequently so uh, naturally this uh, was a much less uh, m a much more difficult business than we imagine the the main uh, uh, you know uh, many of those who managed to reach this th this goals were they did it only in 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 their maturity and those who still hadn't done it were defined, in fact, the youthness, so the the youth, basically. So those who still had to to get through it, uh, to get their sh their their load, their share of, of experience and practice, and they had to earn it, to earn it very toughly. Um, and although the Uvenis, uh, interestingly enough, was conceived more not just as a, a anagraphical uh, characteristics, but rather because of their marital status. The Uvenis were those who still hadn't married, who, ha who still hadn't chosen, in fact, the, uh, you know, they hadn't still had the dowry or of their, of, of their, of their wives. Um, so this is interesting because you understand also how familial um, dynamics were important at this point uh, women were so very important so also in, in chivalry uh, chivalry car um, culture and they have this great importance in courtly love in uh, you know the dame uh, the knight and all this stuff because there was also this kind of uh, hypocrisy laying behind the thing that these guys were looking for someone profitable to marry you know m most of marriages were arranged uh, at all times at this point so this was however you know 
it worked for for that society it did work because objectively the the odds were such that you would prefer such a thing of course why not you know and uh and uh this is uh, an interesting aspect of the story uh getting uh, into a kind of uglier side of the thing uh, in terms of violence strictly meant uh as you can imagine the companies of cavalry men were uh, of errant cavalry men were frequently protagonists of uh um you know they were essentially robbers and looters practically also, this thing of being errant has an inherently logistical reason. You know, the idea is that, the, as we've seen, the, the, the knights had a sort of a tactical edge over the... Uh, I mean, a pretty consistent tactical edge over everyone. So the idea of this loner knight that wanders and so on is uh, pretty equatable in part also to a sort of brigand. Um, and the idea is that you have to feed your horse you have to feed yourself. How do you do? If you go around, well, you simply steal it or rob it. And um, you have a pretty strong logistical need. And if someone comes around because he doesn't want, because you're on his terrain, uh, you're doing something wrong, you can just fence him away. If you're lucky, if you're, you know, because you're a knight, you can easily butcher peasants. And, and therefore, it, it was easy to do that. You know, the idea of uh, being errant because you basically went like a um, uh, like a uh, locust from place to place to, to to raid and pillage to sustain yourself is something really uh, uh, functional to, to that kind of lifestyle and this is all the more evident when you realize that these bands of knights were were um, growing larger yeah, one thing is sustain. You know, having in your in your backyard a knight, single knight with a horse or two that passes there, and uh, uh, you know, it's making a damage. He's making a damage to you, but you know, he will go away. Or you can shoot him kind of relatively easily if you have you know an entire peasant community to move. One problem is when you have twenty knights, forty knights, and that's that's really a problem because they can't do whatever what the hell they want in some way. So partly, this um, the, the formation of this elite of these bands of, tr of 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 knights, etc., brought also surely it was a factor in the structuration of the local communities. Also, in this attempt to frame the knight into something more socially acceptable, in a in a role that was more fitting, more oriented for a you know, common social goal rather than you know this individualistic ethos of the warrior that just went around um, uh, making a mess and uh, you know creating problems. Uh, so uh, there was a, a need to discipline uh, to discipline uh, the uh, knightly behavior and to bring it to a. Um, to a name of greater uh, social advantage, let's say. This actually was unfeasible for the same nature of war, because there weren't just, of politics, I mean, because there, wasn't, there weren't just knights errands. So the, the, the war uh, was pretty transversal in society, as we've seen, you know, there was still the local lords. This was just the knight errands that were the guys who were, you know, the older brothers who were, you know, there ruling um, uh, around. Naturally, this brought contrast and problems also to other, you know, uh, there was an attempt also by the same lords to, to put an end to knightly violence because they were dis dis disrupting their fiefs and their the communities that were subjected to them, etc. So, uh, there was a, uh, especially in, in the ecclesiastical environment and um, uh, during, especially the, the age of, re uh, of the reform of those, you know, moments that eventually brought to the Gregorian reform, this movement uh, that started from France, not surprisingly, because it was evidently where the, you know, the feudal system had, co being more developed, had mostly, uh, you know, had posed most of the problem and now there were also most of the strengths for kind of reformulating something new. Uh, it was produced, um, it was spread a movement known as the uh, uh, Peace of God. Uh, there were also the truces of God later on, 
so this was basically a, a response chiefly by the local uh, of the local bishops with the support of local lords um, uh, uh, given the incapacity of especially the sovereigns to maintain peace in their own territories you know 11th century france had just seen the, the rise of the Cat capetian dynasty that basically ruled just uh, f a few tens of kilometers around around paris and the world kingdom of france was you know left on its own basically um, so it's um at this point to these other local lords either ecclesiastical or, or lay uh, were essentially um, dealing with this problem on their own. Uh, the praxis entailed the convocation of certain assemblies where um, knights uh, also attended, uh, the, the knights also attended, and in which the knights were um, essentially made s a s a swear a, um, a promise to abstain from uh, unjustified violence which is also pretty loose <laughs> definition and not to use especially the weapons in certain periods or in certain days of the year and naturally and especially in the, on those occasions of uh, religious um, holidays this actually existed since a long time I mean if when you uh, once was striking to read um, I think it was at the time of Ludwig II in the Carolingian Kingdom of Italy there was a um, a campaign and I remember against Rome I, it was either the Saracens or some rebellious duke now I don't remember and the royal this was the royal army and there was this capitulary was emanated which stated that it, uh, that uh, during the campaign uh, so these entailed both the f uh, say the vassalatic nobility and the other you know feudal levies of garrisons and militias that existed there in the kingdom to abstain from um, burning churches and committing adultery that means ba in that context not to rape anyone uh, <laughs> in the days approaching the Lent so <laughs> this is interesting because it's not really forbidding you know, all the other possible times it, it, you know avoid that where the land is approaching right in the other days it was normal to burn church and to rape people seemingly uh, so <laughs> uh, th there is really nothing to laugh about so forgive me but it, it's it, it really tells you you know what what was the degree of uh, of violence in that world and how even this Christian ideal of naturally also these needs of disciplining knights and uh, generally violences in general was, was present there in, in a world where objectively public authority was pretty weak and arguably the I think in my opinion the first duty of public authority is to maintain order to pacify to stop violence to provide and that was in fact probably very influenced by medieval times but probably also by sociology uh, as a science because that's what basically all what in medieval times was asked for the first need in every kind of legislation every law was to ensure peace and the same seigneurial system the same feudal system had been born exactly for that reason because the feudal system now had basically taken over everything was even abusing of its power but it had been born as you know free men like the one from the Germanic and the Roman background who basically were asking to sound more strong for protection in exchange of some service why for protection because there was violence and they wanted this violence to stop so the public order the pacification was the fir very first need that was required so it's very interesting that from northern France you start having these pieces of God, truces of God in certain days of the year, in certain uh, times, uh, because eventually that was the uh, the environment where this um, systemic uh, problems deriving from the emergence of a military class were being more manifest. Where also these others, other smaller, uh, let's say these uh, vassals. Uh, 
of the French kingdom were more powerful uh, than than others in the rest of Europe so they had actually if the king was wicked however they had the power to enforce such measures of public order uh, so this kind of uh, this entail actually the, the higher social vertization of Western Frankish society at the time and they were naturally uh, delving in parallel certain ideologies that were meant to define, you know, you know, to, to discipline, to to frame what were the the use of violence, really, at that point. In fact, the same ecclesiastics, the same clergymen that had promoted such initiatives, were attempting now to define a model, uh, an ethical model, hmm, that was in part actually uh, taken from the from the same royal one, so they weren't really inventing anything new at that time, I mean, to which, however, to which the, the the knight had to attain. So here we have the uh, chivalric ideals that are formulated formally um, in, in, this, in this world uh, at many levels. The knight had to defend the poor, uh, the weak, uh, women and children, and so uh, basically, uh, this uh, was an ideal that also during the 12th century we realized was propaga propagated also through uh, chivalric epics with the, into these romances that narrated the uh, the deeds of uh, of knights that were inspired by fate and uh, and and were behaving accordingly because let they said look at the model you should be. And naturally, as we said before, this was very ideal in nature. But the practice was completely different. But nevertheless, this probably served in part as a tool of uh, of discipline, of education, of somewhat of and that naturally was corresponding to uh, to the development of a society that was growing kind of more ordered in time. These were the same centuries in which the feudal monarchies were 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 being. Um, uh, Built were, you know, uh, strengthened and uh, and uh, developed. So I made a couple of videos on that. Um, just Google f feudal monarchies, Schwerpunkt. You should find that. So there was uh, as a ideological frame of this um, conception of, of of chivalry a. Um, a, a, a social organization on um, that was framed with three uh, subdivisions essentially. It is very famous uh, as a model elaborated by certain ecclesiastical intellectuals between the 10th and 11th century and reproposed in the secular uh, in the following centuries um, in a more organic and coherent uh, ensemble um, of three orders. And these were the famously the oratores, bellatores, and laboratores. So these were three ordines, so orders in Latin. The oratores were literally the those who prayed. So those who prayed for the say uh, salvation of the of everybody's soul, actually, because the clergy had this broader you know, responsibility of saving the soul of, of the world, you know, to, to intercede. Excuse me, I drink a little bit. Through their Christ-like, you know, Christ had uh, saved, has saved the world through his, uh, through his sufferings, uh, so the, the, the through the cross the the you know the ecclesiastics the, the clergymen were essentially by imitating Christ's model were they were trying to, to sacrifice themselves in theory I ideally equally also for the salvation of of the world 
the bellatores were in fact instead the knights where be bellum is war in latin so the bellator is the fighter the warrior if you want um though so uh the bellatores are those who fight to defend themselves and the others so those who protect the christian society as a wall because this now how I this is how the knight was conceived uh, ideally as the guy who saved Christian society from internal and external enemies. This is also not given for granted because this idea evolves over time. The, the, the idea of the enemy of the fate. Uh, you know, there is many. There are many metaphorical aspects in in, in Christian Christian mentality. You know, the idea is the greater enemies you have to fight is is the devil. So it's you have to fight within your own soul before being you know, to fight on the outs but there is still someone who needs to fight uh, as a warrior so here violence was being justified for the uh, for the defense of Christianity and the uh, laboratories so um, uh, so those who worked labor is labor essentially and and producing the actually the material uh, base the mat material resources and supplies for the in in the entire social body so th there is a corporal incorporative uh, ideal in th into this view of course so th there is a bit everything it's as if you know this was a single body who had to to pray who had to fight materially but also had to to eat and to work for it for it um, so this is very important, especially the part of the lab, uh, laboratories is uh, very, very important because, as we have said, actually most of the resources that were produced um, uh, at this point, uh, aside from the consumption of uh, you know, the large masses of the peasants and so on, just to survive, were devolved largely to war mm -hmm. and therefore to the knightly class. This is very important to understand at a systemic level. It, even if you see in, in all society, uh, at that point, actually the majority of the surplus was devolved for war. This is typical of pre-industrial societies. Like if you see the Roman Empire, if you look at the expenses of the Roman Empire, you know the state didn't spend basically anything in terms of infrastructures, and it was all about war you know like the, the what base majority of everything was about war and this was the same uh, because uh, it was the easiest paradoxically it was the easiest way individually to 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 profit and there were uh, there was no technological potential for that where the energies were the ones they were so this was the best way and therefore also in the middle ages similarly uh, the, the the vast majority of the surplus was spent into war this is pretty normal. It's pretty evident, uh, also from you know, and 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 it entails that criterion of redistribution that we we're talking about before. That is that basically, you know, the, the economical potential is very low, um, and the only way you have to survive here is to earn as a feudal lord, but to redistribute among your retinue because that's the only way that makes the system uh, intact. Basically, that is many. That is. Um, capable of uh, you know maintaining your own autonomy your own you know your your territorial domination uh, and so on um, so uh, there is consider also that this was a world where the crop rate was so low that basically a peasant who worked for all of his life wouldn't basically would would have not had his life bettered virtually by uh, virtually at all changed you know it's been I don't know how this is naturally a very theoretical statement but it, it's been calculated that uh, after a lifetime of work the average medieval peasant basically had earned just a four percent of his initial asset um, you know more I mean in addition as so you can understand it's virtually meaningless so this this was a world that was virtually idling uh, especially in the 11th century so this uh, even this conception of the three orders and so on was definitely f 
functional to describe that world. I mean, that was functional to describe a kind of a immutable uh, dimension. Now we look at always at history in this um, evolutionary perspective. But if you you know if you think from the perspective of of someone who lives in that in the period, just like our own. We, you, you realize that th th everybody tends actually to, to downsize or to not perceive fully the change while he or she is uh, living into them. This is normal. This is how actually humans realize. So this um, universalistic picture of the three orders and so on is very, very... Um, uh, very important to have the, the, because it, it, it it's really how these people looked at the world in many ways at least of course this was the expression partly of also of the same elite it was also partly justifying this um, social tripartition you know this was functional also to say okay you are a peasant you have to work because you're you're a laborator and I'm a bellator and I have to fight and you have to work for me but it was still functional it was kind of realistic it was kind of uh, adherent to reality in many ways uh, uh, by I as ideal as it could be also especially in moral terms but this is very important and it fitted uh, generally into the Christian mindset as as a tripartition uh, it's like God basically it's one and triune uh, there are three persons in one and it it, it, uh, it lends itself to this kind of bodily and corporative uh, metaphors that you know may consider the societas christiana as a unique organism that works as essentially as a human as a christian uh, himself so uh, I it's very important because all these forces are you know conceived as the limbs of uh, a single body that has to act as uh, with a unique end that is the defense and the propagation of Christianity, and in f it's in fact exactly from this um, this idea that also the uh, the origins of, of the Crusader uh, thought I is emerging. You know, the idea that now the the Christian society feels confident enough, is expanding enough, also to to rationalize the the and channeling the use of violence towards a uh, toward a, a specific target and w w with a certain intent, and that's why the, the idea. And but we will talk about the Crusades uh, in another in another time. So this has been quite of a long video, as usual. <laughs> by the way, um, I just uh, I will definitely keep. Don't worry, I will keep talking about these matters so very much. This was meant just as an introductory video. Uh, we will talk about knights, and knighthood, and crusades, and everything. Uh, just for now, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like. Or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for uh, listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.